All right. <laughs> we will take it from the top. Welcome to the ninth annual Aging Positive. <laughs> we got the audio. Uh, Positively Aging Conference Legacy Inspiring Stories of Thriving with HIV. And we mentioned our community initiative brought to you by the HIV Plus Aging Research Project, LGBTQ Center of the Coachella Valley, Jewish Family Services, Brothers of the Desert, the Transgender Health and Wellness Center, LKA Let's Kick Ass, the AIDS Survivor Syndrome, the Alzheimer's Organization, Parkinson's Research Organization, Desert Oasis Healthcare, Eisenhower Health, and DAP Health. These community organization partners meet throughout the entire year to bring this conference to you every September in conjunction with National HIV AIDS and the Aging Awareness Day, which occurs on September the 18th. And it can only happen with the generosity of all of our supporters today. So I want to acknowledge those one more time. Our host sponsors today, Eisenhower Health Center and V Pharmaceuticals. Presenting sponsors, Avita, Bios Clinical Research, DAP Health, EMO Serrano, Gilead, Napo Pharmaceuticals, Palm Tree Clinical Research, PS Test, Thera Technologies, Walgreens, and yours truly, Brad Furr, the owner of KGA 1031 Me TV FM and Gay Desert Guide. Always proud to be here and thank you for including me um, in this uh, annual event. And first, some housekeeping items. We acknowledge the Kawea people as the original stewards of the land on which we now gather. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work with the indigenous people of this place. We pay our respect to Kawea people, past, present, and emerging, who have been here since time immortal. Now, just a few other housekeeping items before we get started. Our exits are clearly marked here inside of the room, as well as exits out of the hallway. And photography. For those of you in the first four rows, if you do not wish to be photographed or recorded, this entire presentation is on Zoom live stream, and you will be recorded if you are in the first four rows. So you may move back if you wish. Otherwise, uh, you have given us your consent to be filmed today. At the end of the day, oh, I have a lovely raffle prize. One of two Amazon Fire HD10 tablets with wireless keyboard and detachable cases uh, that you can win by turning in your survey at the registration desk at the end of the day. The survey is very important to us every single year. We learn from your comments and your suggestions. And so we are now bribing you with one of these nice two Fire HDs. And I'll remind you throughout the conference today. Oh, so also some cool mints, I understand, are also, I don't know, where are the cool mints? Are they in the bag? Ah, they're in the bag. Um, and also important today, uh, that raffle ticket stapled to your survey, and important you'll notice a volunteer or volunteers standing throughout. Um, and if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please just raise your hand. And then if you would wait for that microphone to come your way, because we are live streaming this on Zoom and we want all of our participants to be able to hear what your question is so that the answer makes sense. All right, to start off today's Legacy Conference, please welcome Dr. Am Am I was gonna say it, wasn't I? Ami student. <laughs> we were just talking about this earlier because it's A-M-I and so occasionally he gets Amy and uh, we're calling him Ami today because that is his name. And we've known each other for a long time, so it's funny that we did this. Uh, Ami is a clinical psychologist specializing in chronic pain, chronic illness, sleep, medical stigma, LGBTQIA plus wellness, and acceptance and commitment therapy known as ACT. He holds a doctorate in psychology from the PGSP Stanford uh, PsyD Consortium and is trained at institutions like the Stanford May, uh, Pain Medical Clinic, UCSF uh, AIDS Health Project, and San Francisco and Boise VA Medical Centers. He worked for eight years for the VA, providing care to underserved rural veterans. 
He also served as a national consultant for the VA's Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia training program. And currently, Dr. Student works full-time in private practice here in the Coachella Valley. He's offering both telehealth services for clients in uh, California, Oregon, and Idaho. Dr. Student. <laughs> All righty. So let's see if that works. Yay. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Um, so as Brad was saying, uh, my name's a little weird, so I'm just gonna start that off. Uh, Ami student, student's just the last name I'm stuck with. Um, I am a health psychologist, and I'd like to just give a little bit of an intro of what that is. So as a health psychologist, I work at kind of the intersection between physical health and mental health. Um, so my specialization is working with folks with chronic illness. Uh, HIV psychology has been a big part of that work for me since actually grad school, my dissertation was on HIV stigma. I've worked in a lot of HIV clinic settings. And um, one of the ways I kind of describe what I do, it, about half my practice are folks that I always say that their body is not cooperating and they're trying to live a full life with a body that doesn't quite cooperate with them. So that's kind of the frame that I use. And um, we're gonna talk today a little bit, well, actually a lot about legacy. Um, and my job today is really to sort of to get us sort of oriented a little bit to what does that actually mean? What are we talking about? I'm going to just share that my bias is obviously a psychological lens. There's probably a lot of pathways in which we could talk about legacy. Um, this is just one of many. Um, so I just want to kind of open this up. And I'm also going to ask for you to participate a little bit. I'm not going to do anything, put anyone on the spot or anything like that just to kind of sort of also bring this back to your own experience so that as you're going through the day, that this can kind of feel a little more connected than just simply watching, you know, panelists and speakers, but actually sort of sits hopefully somewhere with you. So I am a psychologist, so I've just got to disclose that I have no conflicts of interest to share today. Nothing, nothing concerning. All righty. So let's start, I'm actually going to start and sort of hold HIV a little bit on the side here, but we will get there because I wanna just start by talking about legacy in general. And from a psychological perspective, when we think about legacy and we kind of define it, we actually use it as a tool, as a tool to kind of help folks think about what they want to make their lives about. Because when we have a body that's not cooperating, one of the things that most commonly happens is we get so caught up in the struggle with that part of our lives that a lot of what brings us meaning and purpose gets lost. Um, and legacy allows us to kind of put that back into focus and help us start to consider what might be important to us and what we might want to be focusing our lives on as well. So sort of from a basic sort of standpoint here, I think about when I ask clients about legacy, when we talk about legacy, we really talk about kind of if you're driving and you're driving and you get to the end of your road, end of your life, and you look back in that rear view mirror, what would you like to see back there? What would be that? What would it be that you want your life to have been about? What what kind of meaning would you have liked to have brought to yourself, to the world, to others? What do you value? What do you want your life to have stood for? So as you can see, this can be kind of a tool to really take a look back, and then hopefully from where you are today, we take take a step forward into some of that. Now that's sort of a psychological frame for legacy. And I'm kind of curious from other folks, we are gonna be talking about this today, if you feel comfortable. And what well, maybe we can do so we don't have to run around with a mic is you can shout out and I'll just repeat what you say back so folks on Zoom can hear. So what are other folks for, sort of frames for legacy? What, what, when legacy comes to mind, how would you define that? Anyone be willing to share? Being remembered. Being remembered. Excellent. So the, the, the memory of the actual person, we're going to talk a lot about sort of being remembered and how we want to be remembered um, in, in the coming few slides, actually. Thank you. What we did for others. What we did for others. Yeah, I think a big part of thinking about legacy is how, what was our impact on other people? And again, I'm going to, as we sort of talk about how to sort of determine what your legacy is, we're going to be talking about that part as well. How do we want others to have experienced us as we walk through the world. Yes? Did we live up to our values? Great. You're, you're all leading you right down my slides. So thank you so much. <laughs> so yes, did we live up to our values? So the things that we did find important, important, how consistently did we live in line with those and move toward them through our lives? 
Hopefully I'm paraphrasing well, so let me know if I'm not. Uh, anyone else? Impact on history. Impact on history, great. So there's others, and then there's also sort of the broader, like how do we impact the world? The experience of, of not just the others around us, but the world and history in general. And I think when we think of legacy, we often think about folks who have had substantial impact on, on history. Pardon? Were we empathetic? So I think that's a great, and I'm actually going to frame that as a that is a that is actually a very specific frame for legacy, right? If you if you feel that like your legacy was about empathy for others, and that's the legacy you want to lead, I think that's the often one that I hear from folks. It's really important to them. Yeah, one more. Great. So was your impact more positive? Was it more negative? In influencing others, I'm assuming the world around you. Absolutely. Did you bring others along with you? Did you bring others mm -hmm. along with you? So I think that's another great example of when you think about sort of legacy, what when you're leaving legacy, are others still sort of in that process? I hope I'm paraphrasing this right as well. Are they coming along and are they now growing and moving forward? So I want to bring in now HIV, because that's an important part of this. And I'm going to do this in a little bit of a, a roundabout way. So I promise we'll be getting back to legacy. But I want to kind of set something up here. So in psychology, but honestly, and also a lot of spiritual practices and other practices, we tend to differentiate between two areas of, of difficulty in our world. One is pain and one is suffering. And for the sake of this, I'm going to sort of describe pain as this sort of given experience of difficulty living in the world as you are, and in this case with HIV. So pain are all the things that come along from living in this place, in this moment, in this body with HIV. And, and then suffering is all of the struggle we do to cope with that, to manage that, to try to control all of that difficulty, to escape that difficulty, to address that difficulty all that extra work and struggle that goes into it. And I think this is sometimes best explained by kind of giving some examples. So I want to be very clear, this is not an exhaustive list of examples. Like we could probably make five or 10 or maybe 50 more of these, but just to give a sense here. So when I think about pain, we think about obviously the physical pain, right? Sometimes actual pain pain, but other physical symptoms, side effects of medications, the difficulty of doing certain tests and the discomfort of those. The experience of stigmatization. The, in, the emotional experience of depression and anxiety that can sometimes come from having to struggle with a body that's not cooperating. Disability, right? The impact of living in a body that doesn't always cooperate with the environment and with others easily. Financial challenges, right? The, the, the struggle of just living in this moment with this healthcare system and this economy, with a body that, that has a chronic illness. Social rejection. We all have either had experiences or know of folks who have had experiences where by having a body that has HIV, they've experienced that kind of rejection, maybe on a dating app or in other areas of their lives, family relationships. And then I always include this one because it's, it's one I think we're all very aware of, we're aware of navigating a dysfunctional healthcare system, right? As, as lovely as some of our providers and systems can be, we know that right now, living in this moment, in this place, with a body that has a chronic medical illness, there's, there's a lot to navigate. This is kind of what I'll, I'll describe as kind of like the given. It's the stuff that we only have so much control over changing. There's some stuff we can do here, right? We can take medications. We can, you know, speak to a financial plan. I mean, you can imagine the things that we can do, right? There's, but there's only so much we can do. And in my office, it's, there's actually not as much I can do about this. Then there's the suffering. What do we do in response to all of this? Some people end up withdrawing, isolating, avoiding certain situations. Maybe they really want to date and they, they're avoiding dating because of all of this difficulty. They might sort of engage in unworkable substance use, maybe excessive substance use to dull out some of this challenge. They might sleep away the day, right? They might just sort of disappear, pull the comforters over their head, kind of just try to get through each day with minimal impact. You might distract yourself. We've all been a, all been doom scrolling, I promise, uh, at <laughs> this point, right? But doom scrolling can become a distraction. 
maybe they're you know watching hours and hours of TV and they're sort of distant from their life because it's easier to do that than to sort of deal with this discomfort. Complaining, blaming, fighting. I always put this in there because in some ways, sometimes this is an opportunity to try to gain some control in your life, right? When all this, it feels really hard and out of control. And, you know, maybe they're they're fighting with their partner or they're going to the healthcare office and they're screaming and yelling because they're really upset and tired of all of these difficulties. The way to sort of, even whether it works or not, this is sometimes a way to feel like, okay, I'm trying to exert some control over this. Ignoring your problems. Some folks go the other way. They, they stop going in for their blood work. They sort of disappear um, for any new symptom. They kind of just push it off. Or people go the other direction. They get excessively hypervigilant about everything that comes up. Anything over here in the pain that's difficulty, they, they're online. They're checking Dr. Google. They're, they're checking into their finances. They're you know doing all the extra work, extra work, extra work, causing a lot more anxiety and stress. Maybe they're even going to the doctor urgent care, ER, all the time, every new symptom that comes up. And then there's a sort of internal suffering part of this too, right? The ruminating, the worrying, the wondering, the taking inventory of your body. What is it like today? Was it like this yesterday? What if I didn't have HIV? Gosh, what would life have been like? All that sort of internal struggle. So clearly, one is in reaction to the other. So one way we kind of think about this, or I use sort of this metaphor a lot, I use a lot of metaphor in therapy with folks, because I think it's a nice way to kind of sort of touch back on it throughout the week. So, hey, are we doing, are we back in this metaphor again? So one way to kind of think about this is, if you think about a beach ball, and think about beach ball as kind of a pain part, all the stuff that we're just stuck with by living in a body that's not cooperating at this time in this place. We could spend a lot of our lives saying, hey, I don't really like this beach ball. We'd love to pop it. It's a pretty impermeable beach ball, right, at least at this point. Someday, hopefully, we'll be able to pop it. But for now, it's there, and it's in the water. So the next best thing we can do is we try to get it out of our way. We try to make it disappear, try to minimize its impact on us. So what we do is we try to push it under the water. And if you've ever been, I would say a kid, but if you're like me, an adult, trying to push a beach ball under the water, we all know what happens, right? It starts to push back. And the more you push down, the more it pushes back. And I purposely sort of, I'm playing with AI images for the first time, <laughs> made, made this guy look like he's, yeah, he's sweating, right? This is intense. This is a lot of work, right? And we all know what else is going to happen. It's going to pop up over there. And we got to get it back under control. And that's going to pop up. Oh, this thing's been popped up. Oh, my, my, che my check bounced. Oh, I got to get this into the water. And the other part about this is that it becomes a full-time job. There's no, there's no letting up. If he wants this under the water, he's got to do this all the time. So pain is much like the beach ball. Suffering is all the work we're doing to try to keep it submerged. Okay. So in therapy, one of the things that I work with on folks is how do we reduce the suffering? If there's not much we can do with pain, and by the time people come to me, they've usually done a lot of that work. You know, they've sort of done the basics of what they can to manage the pain. And there may be more that they can do. But we can work on sort of reducing the suffering part. Because that we have a lot more choice in and how we relate to this stuff. But there's kind of another approach to this. And this is something else we do in therapy, but there's another approach. And this is where we're going to pull legacy back in. Which is what we could do instead of just trying to get rid of the suffering. And I'm going to use the metaphor here and then we're going to talk about how it kind of reapplies back to legacy. The other option we have we can't get rid of the beach ball. It's sort of tethered to us. Is we could pick up that beach ball, put it under one arm, and start swimming. Now, would it be easier to swim with both arms? Absolutely. But we can't do that. We don't have that choice. It's tethered to us. But there's another piece of this. Okay, so we're going to go swimming. But where are we swimming? Why are we swimming? If we're swimming towards something that's worthwhile, all of a sudden that much harder one arm stroke becomes a lot easier because there's something worthwhile that we're swimming towards. And what we could be swimming towards is our legacy. And this is why this becomes important <laughs> in the work that I do. And I think today will provide a lot of hopefully opportunity for folks. So if you are swimming, 
with this under your arm, all of a sudden, if you're swimming, let's say there's a group of wonderful new people over there and you're gonna get to know them and you're gonna swim over to them and connect with them and maybe make some really in intense, wonderful connections with folks. Or maybe you're gonna teach some kids how to play Marco Polo because they, they don't they look like they're not, you know. All of a sudden that, that meaning, suddenly this thing gets dwarfed a bit. It's there, it's annoying. It'd be easy to do all of this with both hands, but it, it's suddenly the impact of it, it moves a bit to the back burner. This is what we know, honestly, psychologically, but also probably just sort of, you know, pragmatically here. If you are engaged in stuff that's meaningful and fulfilling, a lot of the pain is there, but it, it takes a day, we have a different relationship to it. Not only that, I want to just add that when you have pain, there's another part of this metaphor, which is, it's actually a little bit different to swim with something that's buoyant. It actually gives you a little bit of help. And sometimes we can actually turn to our pain to provide some buoyancy and help us inform how we swim and what the ways in which we engage our meaning. And so there's this other layer here where if we actually include and consider HIV in our legacy and in that work, sometimes it can actually provide its own assistance to meaning. I add, I, I don't know if people are familiar with Victor Frankl. Victor Frankl, author, professor, speaker, um, was a concentration camp survivor, wrote a fantastic book that I highly recommend about finding meaning. And he talks a lot about the incredible pain of being in a concentration camp. And, you know, the mistreatment, the racism, the starvation, all of the things, the death, destruction. And he talks a lot about how he made it through and also how others maybe didn't. And what he found is by finding meaning, even in the hardest, darkest circumstance, things shifted for him. And not only that, he found some meaning in the darkness, out of the dark. So this is one of many fantastic books I highly recommend reading anything Victor Frankl. Um, in some ways, suffering ceases to be suffering at the moment it finds meaning. And remember, we're not talking about pain, we're talking about suffering. The HIV, the financial struggles, that doesn't go away. The suffering part shifts when we start to find meaning. So what's your legacy? And I think some folks mentioned history and, and, and you know, I added ACT UP in here and keep caring and other areas where folks have found a lot of legacy in their, in their pain. Um, teaching, inspiring young people, social justice work, volunteering, advancing medicine, loving others, enjoying time together, connecting. I love this dancing photo, I'm very happy. Um, so what is your legacy? And this is where I want us to sort of start going a little bit to sort of think about what's important to you. So this already, you can tell by the slides, a little bit morbid. Um, I'm just gonna be honest here. There's really the one, the best way to think about legacy is to think about at the end. And so I'm just gonna take us there. I know it's 10 o'clock in the morning, but we're gonna go <laughs> to, some, to something a little bit challenging here, but I think it's worth us stepping into it because it gives you perspective, right? Go to the end of the drive, look in that rear view mirror. So this is an example. So at the end of our lives, many of us will have a tombstone. Now, this isn't your typical tombstone with dates. But I like to think of this imagery because I think it's helpful. At the end of your life, on your tombstone, what would you like people to see about what your life was about? Quite a perspective shift. So I just put one here. Um, and I'll be honest, this is uh, thinly veiled from a client his name is not Sam, don't worry. Uh, here lies Sam. His life was about contributing to the well-being of others, being loving, genuine, adventurous, and playful. Quite a legacy. So for a few moments, I'd like us each to consider what we'd like on our choose. I'm going to ask you to do, just, if you don't mind, Go ahead and either close your eyes. If you're not comfortable with closing your eyes, then you just drop your gaze down to your feet. And I'm going to just ask you for a moment 
to stand by your grave. I know that's a little bit hard, but if you could just practice a little bit of willingness with me for the value of this. And I'd like you to take a look at your tombstone. And on that tombstone, you get to choose what's on it. And I, I think sometimes it's helpful to hear lies, put your name in. And their life was about. If you need a little inspiration, you can open up one eye. I put a bunch of words up here that we frequently use. But then go ahead and close your eyes back up. And just begin to think about some of the primary qualities, meaning, purposes. People mentioned empathy. People mentioned bringing others along. And I also invite you, if HIV is part of that legacy, to consider how that might buoyant, that buoyant part might help you sort of inform what's important to you. As you start to clarify that, if people feel comfortable, there's no pressure here. People wouldn't mind if anyone's willing to share kind of some of the things that they like. Those would be full sentences. Some of the things they like, like written on their tombstone. And again, no pressure. This is this we get we get personal here, so I understand. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to share about what they'd like their legacy to be about? Yes. yes. Share his life with others. Share his life with others. Shared his life with others. I think sharing is such a powerful world, word in that moment, right? Like it's not just being with others. Sharing implies a quality of experience with others. I love that. Adversity from fear. Great, adversity from fear. So was able to sort of stand with fear and, and sort of boldly face it. Is that, is that what you're describing along those lines? Okay, so I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm trying to get it, help me clarify. How would I get it better? My name's Ari, by the way. Um, so through life, I've developed some fears, and I didn't know how to address them. Uh -huh. um, you know, and only through learning what my fears are was I able to confront them. And I believe what you're talking about is also um, from adversity is realizing that one our greatest defects could be one of our best attributes. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I hear in there a few pieces. Approaching challenge with, an, uh, with a sort of learning mind, kind of like approach challenges as a way to learn and grow. Am I getting it a little better now? Okay, all right. If there was one over here, yes. Um, my name's Ron, and <clears throat> I would like to, what I see is passionate. Passion, great. Do you have a, are there certain things around which you would want to focus that passion? Do you have a sense? Okay, so it, it, sort of meeting the world with passion. Okay, great. Yes, one more. A purpose, my, I feel like my purpose is to serve. To serve, great. Yes. To serve others, serve, serve the world a bit. Great. So service, absolutely. One more. These are great, by the way. These are, and I always kind. Kindness. I think kindness is a really important one for a lot of folks. Absolutely. Um, I often distinguish there between kindness and niceness. Um, I think kindness really says a lot for folks about what they who they want to be. So I also want to, and I probably should have said this beforehand. These are personal. There's no, there, there, there's going to be overlap. People are going to be like, yeah, that one too. But also, they're they're individual. And I've done this with hundreds and hundreds of clients. Um, and there's overlap. And there's some themes, you know, certain things that people really embrace. But they're also very personal. This is why I'm asking you to think about your tombstone. So there's one other part to this, which is someone mentioned this earlier. Are you pursuing this legacy that you just decided to find? And um, I added Sam in here. And so one way we think about this, again, sort of clinically, but I think is also really useful, is if you were to die today, what would your tombstone say? 
Not the one you'd like to have it say, but what would it actually say in this moment? So here lies Sam. His life was only about surviving each day, sticking to himself and complaining about those who made his life difficult. <laughs> right? And very human experience of pain and suffering, right? Very human. We've all probably had a version of that at times in our life. And if this is the same Sam from before, if Sam died today versus what Sam wanted his legacy to be about, there's distance to make up. So I'm going to ask for everyone to do this without sharing, because this is very personal. What I would like you to do is I would like you to imagine in your head a scale of 1 to 10. One is if you died today, your tombstone would be incredibly far and distant from what you just described as your legacy. Five would be, okay, some of my time and energy is spent on that. I I'm, I'm headed in the direction. Ten is like, hey, I am living that day in, day out all the time. If you are a 10, um, we need to study you. You are like, uh, <laughs> um, so I imagine somewhat every, all of us are below 10. For yourself, please don't share this because this is really personal. Just give a sense of, an, a, you know, these are somewhat arbitrary numbers. Just where on that scale are you? And, and see if you can be really honest with yourself. And I'm gonna ask you today to think about if you're at a two, what would it take for you to get a, to a two and a half or a three? If you're at a five, five and a half, six. I don't want you to think about how do I get eight digits ahead? Just that first step, first half step in the direction. Because that's a much more manageable thing. And we all know about inertia and momentum. And right once we get started, things get a little bit easier. But sort of sometimes we got to start sort of focused and small. And maybe it's putting down the phone a little bit and talking to the neighbor a little bit longer when they say hello, or maybe it's showing up here. Whatever that first step is, I want you to actually get kind of thoughtful about like an actual goal, not a, it'd be great if I was, but like, what is a thing you could actually accomplish? When we think about goals, one of the things we always talk about is, are they accomplishable? Is it something you can actually do? So think about something you could do pretty simply, just outside of reach. And I know we've got to go, but I just am curious if anyone has on mind anything that they would be willing to share about that goal that they have, about approaching their legacy a little bit more. Live more in gratitude. Live more in gratitude. Great. Great. I think I would be a 10. I would want my, my tombstone to be uh, here lies Ricardo Reyes and just one word, survivor. And in parentheses, I would I would put a survivor of full-blown AIDS and a massive stroke, period. So, right, sometimes our legacy is just, as I think someone said, is like making it through the hard stuff, right? I, what I would just invite you to consider is having made it through the hard stuff, what would you like your life to be about now? And sometimes that, again, it's sort of like that beach ball, like it's there, you have that history, that experience. Where would you like to take your life with all of that experience now? And, and I don't know, that, that'll be personal for you, but like sort of where it is that you would wanna go with that hard stuff. Um, anyone else? What I really wanna invite you to do today, we're gonna to be talking about legacy in lots of different ways is to kind of consider how it interacts with your life. How does it inform how you want to move forward after today? And I just, I replaced this slide just because I think this is, there's, at least I found this kind of inspirational in thinking about legacy for myself and kind of where I want to go and options for me. So I think we're right on time. So this is my contact info. If you have questions, want to chat this through a little bit, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'll be around today too. So thank you. Over here. Tommy, thank you. That was beautiful. What a great way to start our uh, our sessions today. Thank you. Right. And I'll turn that on so you can hear me. 
Our second speaker today, Bill Cavanaugh. Bill's the author of Hold Your Fork, Something Sweet is Coming, a signed copy of which is in each of your bags today. And Bill is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Southern California. Prior to becoming a mental health professional, Bill spent his career writing scripts for everything from the Olympics to award ceremonies and the Walt Disney Company. He received his master's in clinical psychology from Antioch University, Los Angeles, after battling stage four cancer. As a writer for Psychology Today, he addresses ideas that can transform trauma into happiness. Pleased to welcome Bill Cavanaugh. Thank you so much, Brad. And thank you, Ami, for that incredible talk. I'm going to actually I'm going to actually be referring to a lot of the things that you talked about in my speech as well. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here today as well. I want to start by telling a little bit a little story from when I was just about five or six years old. My aunt Margaret, not to be confused with Anne Margaret, but my aunt Margaret. Uh, was uh, she was my also my godmother, and she was a harpist for the Columbus Symphony. She would uh, one of her favorite things to do was to take me into her home and play the harp for me. And because we were Irish, her favorite song was "Oh Danny Boy," um, but she would sing it "Oh Billy Boy." When she would finish, she would always say. Okay, Billy, now talk to the harp. It was her genius way of getting me to talk about my feelings, which I'm going to be doing today too, so get ready. <laughs> um, but the amazing thing is that here I am, 60 years later, talking to the harp. Aunt Margaret's up there smiling. She'd be very, very happy. She also always showed me how the harp brings harmony to the symphony. Harp creates harmony. I relate that to this organization. They bring harmony to the long-term survivors, major universities, the NIH, and the entire outside community. They bring harmony through stories, outreach, research, and fundraising. And for that, I thank them seriously from the bottom of my heart for all that you do. Okay, I don't want to harp on this any longer. <laughs> Let's get to the reason that I'm here. Nothing in my life could be more important than for me to stand in front of a, group, a room full of people who understand my biggest purpose. And that is to discover a life that so many of our friends never got to live. Sorry, I didn't get to that one. <laughs> this is the question. What would they want us to do for them? The answer to that question is to help others, love each other, enjoy and appreciate what we have. And most important, in my opinion, is to laugh. And all of the things that you all shared earlier with, with Ami are exactly the reasons that we're here and so much for us to focus on. As I show you a few photos of my closest friends who were taken by AIDS, the clicker is not quite working. It's a delay on that screen. Okay. Um, I also want to touch on for a moment about those few, few moments that we got to share with them as they took their last breath. Nothing in our lives could be more special, and there's no greater gift than allowing them, for them to allow us to be there with them. I also recall a few times when the nurses would say, um, when the nurses would say, you have to leave the room and allow them to go because it's too difficult for them to say goodbye. So many incredible and beautiful memories that we all have. 
and ironically, it brought a form of beauty into our lives that most of the world never had. Most people don't understand how beautiful those moments are that we got to spend with them. The theme of this conference today is legacy, theirs and ours. I'll tell you one of my funniest legacies. Most of, it, most of us have no idea how we became positive. My partner, Randy, back in the early 80s, always said that he became positive from attending sex parties at Rock Hudson's house. And he believed that sincerely. And I believe I became positive from Randy. So for me, HIV stands for Hudson in my veins. In my mind, there's a reason that we call it HIV positive. The positive reflects all the great things that came from that horrible crisis. There were lots of positive gifts. I always say if you hand a lemon to a group of gays, you better expect something much more fabulous than just lemonade. <laughs> for one, look at all we did for the world of fundraising. We created all the walks, the runs, and the rides. And on a side note, I have to say that for several years, um, I've been working at cancer support community and I've been trying to get them to do a cancer crawl um, where everyone crawls around a stadium in a relay race. They always laugh at me and say, oh, that's so sweet. Um, but I still think it's a great idea because you can't crawl without laughing. And it's such a fun thing to do. Of course, one of the most creative and special ideas was the red ribbon. Now everyone has their own color ribbon. Back in 1988, I was traveling the country with an AIDS fundraiser musical called Heartstrings. We were in New York City and our host was Christopher Reeve, the original Superman. A young man came backstage and said, he had, said that he had had a dream the night before that everyone started wearing little red ribbons in support of our community. He gave us all little ribbons and asked if we would wear them on our lapels. My first thought was, oh, oh God love you, honey. <laughs> but Christopher said that he would wear it. And so the rest of us did too. And now today, I want to say to that young man, God love you, honey. A year later, it became the Ribbon Project, as well as a fabulous gay accessory. And I still have the original little red ribbon that he gave me that day in New York. Another side note is when I was a little boy, our parents used to call our penis our tinkle bottom. You wonder where this is going, don't you? I was probably about seven years old and I was sitting on the sofa with my little brother and we were watching Christopher Reeve, the Superman. And I said to my brother, when you watch Superman, does it make your tinkle bottom feel funny? He was definitely my first crush and my first hint of horny. And the amazing, beautiful part of that story is that I got to tell him that when we were, when we were doing the show in New York, 25 years later, he laughed so hard. And then he said, what's your tinkle bottom? <laughs> Another beautiful opportunity that I was given was to speak at the National Mall in Washington in, in Washington, DC in 1982. There we go. For the AIDS quilt display. I'm sure some of you were probably there. That year there were 12,000 panels on display. Four years later in 1996, there were 20,000 panels and 1.2 million people attended it. I'd made several quilts before this and it was emotional for me to see them on display. This is the quilt that I made for Randy since his favorite flower was the bougainvillea. Uh, and this is a photo of Randy and I. Um, with our little dog Dexter and our cat Wang Lee. And Wang Lee stood for what's a nice girl like you doing here. <laughs> right after I spoke in DC, I was standing beside that quilt that I made for Randy, and I noticed that because it was fall, there were so many colorful maple leaves that had fallen on all of the quilts. 
and I got chills thinking about the fallen leaves and the risen souls. Both the quilts and the leaves were symbol of beautiful colors as a gift from death. Randy had been writing a journal before he died titled Hope, Beauty, and Eternity. Oh, okay. Okay. Hope burned it. Uh, and there it was on full display for thousands to see. He had begged me never to read his journal until after he died. That way he could be completely honest. And it took me several weeks after his, after his death to finally open it. And it was too powerful to read. It brought too many incredible emotions from me. My new passion became promoting his legacy. From that display in DC combined with his journal, I began creating a series of artwork. Each one had a personal possession of Randy's on the artwork, such as a cufflink or a tie clip, which I think old, most of you are old enough to know what those are. <laughs> Each one also had a quote from his journal. Some of them had um, the actual maple leaves that I found that day in DC. Um, the interesting thing is, is that on a lot of the pieces of art, the quotes have faded away and dissolved and have completely disappeared. And I haven't been able to find the symbolism for that yet. I also published a book with some of Brandy's quotes in it. The title, also one of his quotes. That's the interior of the book. The title uh, of the book was, I know the time is now. Um, I have several copies of that book here today as well. If anyone would like another free gift, I'm happy to give them to you. There are so many stories, good and bad, from the AIDS epidemic. We need those stories for healing. We all need to heal. Just like any tragedy in our life, we don't simply say, well, now I can get back to normal. Normal is gone. There is no normal anymore. I always say it's like telling Jackie Kennedy to clean the blood out of her dress and get back in the parade. The parade is over. When we heal, we must first learn to mourn the loss of our assumed future. What we thought was our future is no longer there. For me, I had to leave Houston, the city where I went through it all. Most of my friends had died, so I decided to start a new life in Los Angeles. For many years, people had asked me, since I was in the entertainment field, why didn't I live in LA? And I always jokingly said, oh, LA is just a bunch of drug addicts. Well, sure enough, soon after I moved there, I started that addiction. I know that underneath it was that I thought I was probably going to die, so why not just have fun? That's not what legacy is about. One day I met a guy and I asked him if he wanted to do some drugs with me. And he said one word that changed my life, he called me a loser. When I was a little boy, my father would never let us say three words, fool, stupid, or loser. He said, no one is stupid. No one's a fool and no one's a loser. And there was another reason that that word hit me so hard. When I was 14, I was walking to art class one day and a group of bullies started shoving me around. They threw all my art supplies on the ground and they started shouting loser. When they ran off, I sat on the ground picking up my art supplies and I stopped and I looked up at the sky. And I know this sounds like a huge drama queen, but I said out loud, this will be the hardest day of my life. To this day, I still believe that statement. But the gift that came from it was that those bullies taught me a tremendous amount of courage. When I finished high school, I couldn't wait to get the hell out of that small Ohio town. Most of them are still there. So when this man called me a loser for doing drugs, I knew he was right. This time, I was a loser. 
Not only would I never want to be that for my father, but also for all the friends that left their legacy of love and happiness. So once again, I turned loser into courage and I said out loud, this will be the best day of my life. Three weeks ago, I celebrated 21 years of sobriety. Five years later, after getting sober on Christmas Eve, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. First thing I said to the doctor was, I'm so sorry I didn't get you anything for Christmas. <laughs> he said, this is serious, you might not live. To which I responded, that is so 1980s. <laughs> and then I told him if I had learned anything in life, it's that our struggles become our greatest rewards if we choose to allow them. So much of what you shared, it's, it's pain versus suffering. So once I overcame the cancer battle, I really searched for the meaning of both addiction and cancer in my life. In my life, I was determined to find the reward. So at 55, I decided to go back to school and six years later, I became a licensed therapist. It's never too late to make a change. You'll all be getting copies of my book today, which was published last year. Uh, it was a lifelong journey of documenting things that I've learned. Loser becomes courage, the loss of our friends becomes a new motivation for living, and cancer becomes a new career. Joan Rivers said, <laughs> we love Joan Rivers, you can't be brave if you've only had wonderful things happen to you. The number one most important lesson has been that there is always hope. There is always something good coming that's just waiting for you. That's why the title of the book is Keep Your Fork, Something Sweet is Coming. Behind Disney Hall in LA, there's a beautiful sculpture named the Lillian Disney Fountain. <clears throat> it was created by breaking all of her Delft china into thousands of pieces and then reforming them into a new realm of beauty. It completely inspired me, showing blatantly that our broken pieces can turn into art. I'd like to share one story that's in the book. It's about a young boy named Zachary. And I can never tell the story without crying, so get ready. My I'm gonna tell a lot of the quotes here that my father always said, but one of them was, tears are love solidified. And I believe that, that when you cry, it's, it's coming from your soul and your heart. And then he also always said, if you wanna stop crying, think about French kissing your grandmother. <laughs> it, it works every time. So if I just happen to say grandma that slips out, you'll know what I'm talking about. So back to Zachary. In 2002, I was touring with the Salt Lake City Olympic Torch as manager of ceremonies. We were in Providence, Rhode Island, and it was freezing temperatures. When we arrived, a sweet older woman named Molly, um, we were greeted by Molly. I asked her why she was there in such cold weather. And in her beautiful Irish accent, just like my Aunt Margaret, she said that her eight-year-old grandson, Zachary, was one of the biggest fans of the Olympics. And she wanted to get a photo of the torch for him. Sadly, Zachary was in the hospital with lymphoma. I escorted Molly up onto the stage so that she could get a photo holding the torch under the, Olympics, under the Olympic flag. And then I gave her a small torch relay pin to give to Zachary. Two weeks later, it was the morning of opening ceremonies in Salt Lake City, and I just happened to run very quickly into my office to get some paperwork. At that exact moment, the phone rang, and I answered it in a hurry. It was Molly. 
She wanted me to know that Zachary had died that morning. He died holding the pin, and his last words were, I'm going to the Olympics. Molly asked me for two favors. The first one was, as the cauldron was being lit in the stadium that evening, please pray for Zachary's soul going to heaven at that moment. And secondly, she said something that changed my life. She said to please always remember that life is not about entertaining millions of people like we would be doing that day, but it's instead life is about one person helping one person at a time, as I did when I gave her the pin. I never forgot what she told me. I repeated it so many times in my head, and eventually it moved me to become a therapist. I went from entertaining the large crowds like Molly had talked about to sitting and helping one person at a time in the room. Five years later, I got the exact same cancer as Zachary. And so once again, why did I live when this poor, poor little eight-year-old boy didn't? I've always had a fascination for the number 1111. I've met several others throughout my life who also share that fascination. For me, it represents the comforting symbol that everything is lined up exactly as it's supposed to be in life. Again, it's harmony. It's the strings on a harp. It's the top of a fork. Representing my book. It's been my address, it's been my phone number. It's the time that I automatically look at my watch. And here's the biggest symbol for me. I was having a dream one night that I was telling my mother about 1111. She held up a sign that said, honey, that's why I named you that. William is 1111 I am. I am 1111. Harmony and hope. Everything in life is lined up as it's supposed to be in a synchronistic manner that we'll never understand. It always has been and it always will be. And that's what it can be so comforting for us. About four months ago, I decided to announce my retirement, but I was a little afraid of what life would be then. Um, what would I do if I was retired? A week later, I was diagnosed with cancer again, and I had to receive radiation and chemotherapy. Once again, don't worry about what's next. The universe will tell you what's next. I finished treatment a few weeks, just a couple of weeks ago, I finished radiation. So now I get to worry again. What's my new purpose in retirement? How does aging and slowing down make our purpose and meaning work better? What part of processing is that, a uh, part of my processing is that I'm starting a support group for men in retirement who don't know who they are in retirement. Let me know if you might be interested in that group. Um, but we're gonna ask questions like, when does relaxing become lazy? When does quiet time become lonely? When do routines become boredom? And what are the gifts in retirement? Again, there's always the gifts. They're always there. The biggest lesson I have learned is to always say yes to what life hands us next. This is my father's picture. I told you the three words that he would never let us say. But the word that he always insisted we do say was yes. He was the main speaker at my eighth grade graduation. Uh, and I never forgot what he told us, mostly because I was so embarrassed that he was up there saying anything. <laughs> but he, always, he told us to always keep climbing the ladder of life. And that means to always say yes to the next step. It's never comfortable to climb. But the higher you go, the more beautiful the world is below you. 
and there's no end to the ladder. I need to remember today in early retirement what I heard at my eighth grade graduation that there's no end to the ladder. Now, here's a little funny story about dad and the word yes. On his deathbed, he'd been unconscious for a few days. And as my brother sat there with him, dad opened his eyes and said yes and died. He took the next step. My brother gave a beautiful eulogy about dad and the word yes. My father's name was Joseph. And my brother said that St. Joseph only has one word in the Bible, and that word is yes. It was a beautiful story. But here's the real story. <laughs> my father loved sex. He had a penile implant, and he always loved to pump it up, even at age 88. <laughs> Just as he was dying, he inflated it, opened his eyes and went, yes. So my brother and I had to fight over who was going to deflate it as they were carrying him out in the bag. It looked like a tent as they were carrying him out. So at the end of that beautiful eulogy that my brother gave, he looked at me in the audience and he winked because we both knew what yes really meant. <laughs> so my last message today is about secrets. We all grew up holding secrets. They were about our identity, our fantasies, and even our funny little games that we would play. When I was six years old, there was a neighbor down the street named Christine. She was 12 and I was... I was about, about six. Christine came to, vi to visit me one day and took me into the closet in my bedroom. And she said we were going to play a little game. We would see who could put their most red hots up the other one's butt. <laughs> the, the worst part of the game was that because it was a secret and we didn't want anyone else to know, we'd put the red hots back in the bag and put them back in the bag. <laughs> This secret was the beginning of many secrets to come. Let's face it, I was in the closet. I was playing with little pills that gave me a sensation, and I was putting things in my butt. In my butt. It was the story of my life right there with Christine. <laughs> my mother at the time was my everything. This was my favorite photo of her. She was Columbus Rose Queen. And what could be a bigger dream for a little gay boy than to have a mother that's Columbus Rose Queen? <laughs> um, about the same time as the Red Hots, she took me to the garden store to buy lilac seeds. She said we'd plant them in the backyard and it would be our secret. When they would bloom, we would say surprise to the rest of the family. Just a few months after we planted them, she suddenly died on New Year's Eve. When our father told us the next morning she had died, I was too young to comprehend what death was. All I could think about was what was I supposed to do with that secret of the lilacs? After many years, I came to realize that just like the lilac seeds, my mother had planted a beautiful little gay boy into the world. And one day, I would say surprise to the world and to my family and bloom in what, what was supposed to be the colors that I was meant to be. Many years later, while I was working on the Heartstrings tour, I was waiting on the bus one morning in Indianapolis. I was feeling overwhelmed with the sadness of all the death that we were experiencing on this mu musical journey around the country. I got off the bus to walk through a large park in the snow. And I was, I was, as I was walking through the gazebo, I saw a shiny little plaque in the middle of the gazebo. I brushed away the snow and saw that the plaque said, smile, lilacs will bloom here in the spring. So many positive emotions surged through me and I knew that there was hope. And most amazingly, <laughs> 
Grandma. <laughs> when you were sharing today, it made me realize this is what I want on my tombstone. For those of us who grew up Catholic, confession was the place to reveal our secrets and have the Lord make them disappear. But God forbid we ever reveal our real secrets, right? That's what secrets were for, to remain secret. I can't imagine ever telling the priest that I had nasty thoughts about Tommy King, much less putting red hots up my butt. <laughs> our secrets became shameful. We were shamed for being gay. We were shamed for becoming positive. And for many of us, we were shamed for our addictions which often developed while trying to deal with all the rest of the shame. Together, we can release those shames. We are who we are and what we've lived through. We've overcome them, and for that we should be proud. Just like the struggles of bullying, shame becomes our mark of courage and wisdom. Please don't ever forget how courageous you have been in your life and all that you have gone through. It's why we're all here today, to celebrate our legacy. And that legacy is beautifully created through our courage and hope and our passion, our strength to get through the challenges that have made us brave, successful, and extremely respected. And for that, I thank every single one of you. Thank you. I, I know we shared, I have four questions that I kind of want to ask all of you. Um, the first one, what does legacy mean to you? We kind of reflected on that already. Um, but has anybody had anything come up that they would like to share a little bit more about what legacy means to you? Let me go to the next question then is, how do you discover a purpose? That's one I would definitely like some answers. The purpose discovers you. Ooh, the purpose discovers you. <laughs> hang, hang on one second. A career counselor opened my eyes one time when I was going through a little problem and the students and asked me. And it was so simple. And I just focused on that. What do I want? Might help you find a purpose. I, I'd like to explain, expand one a little bit more on how does purpose find you? Well, I think we don't consciously say, I need to discover a purpose. It's life's challenges impose that upon you. And like you were saying, with making lemonade or something more fabulous, you know, you, you make that choice, right? This has happened. You know, HIV is a big one for many of us. And what do you do with it? How do you turn that around and um, find a purpose within it? If that makes any sense. And going back to Charlie, then, have you have you allowed life to find you that purpose? incrementally <laughs> i ask myself the question all the time it's it's like a more like a process than a it's done in the back good morning um i believe that that purpose is already there in in the gentleman's case, yeah, you discover it. It's something that kind of selects you. But because of where we are and the road that we've traveled, life in itself is purpose. And that makes it easier to relieve the stress of trying to find it, right? Knowing that it's there. Very much so. 
the gentleman that talked about a career counselor reminded me of my experience with a career counselor. Um, and I was, I had said I always wanted to do and told him what I wanted to do. And he said, what have you done to advance that? And he said, if you really want to know what you wanted, look at your calendar. And for me, that's become a wake up call because if I tell myself I want to do something and I want to do a purpose, I have to look at where I'm spending my time and what I'm doing. And I'm really curious, do you look at the calendar from the past or do you look at what's on the calendar for the future? I look at the calendar from the past because that's where I'm spending my time and that helps me adjust my calendar for the future. Mm. Okay, oh, one more. Um, uh, I spent uh, a lot of years in the church and, and, and the question was always instead of purpose was calling. And, and, and I found that that uh, calling purpose uh, has always been more evolutionary than epiphanal uh, in church language that, uh, uh, that I could never say the exact moment of, uh, uh, of knowing, but it's more about being aware and saying yes. And in, in the moment and, and to move on to the next stage, whatever, whatever that is, it's just being willing to, to, to say yes. To step up. And, and open. Okay, the next question that I'd love is what does retirement mean for you? Retirement for me meant earning my bachelor's degree. I, at 60, at 57 years old, I decided. The only way that I was going to effect the purpose of my life was to get the education that I always dreamed of. And I completed that May of this year. Oh. So, um, I was uh, going to announce my retirement when I was 65, which was five years ago. And <clears throat> it was the beginning of COVID. We didn't know that, but um, uh, I think it was March of 2020 that was going to be my retirement. <clears throat> Sorry. The man sitting next to me that year had his fifth stroke. And I think it gets back to um, your purpose discovering you or finding you and uh, I became his full-time caregiver. And he gives me purpose every day. And when I least expected it, when I thought I'd be traveling, when I thought I would be doing all the things that we think we're going to do in retirement, I'm able to give to him what he needs on a daily basis. And it really is fulfilling. Thank you so much for that. It just shows that age and purpose, it purpose keeps coming, doesn't it? Okay, well, before we end, the last question that I have is, is does anyone want to share a childhood secret? <laughs> Somebody's got to have one. Turn to you. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> Microphone. I 
<laughs> yeah, watch out what you drink here today. Okay, I don't necessarily want to end on that. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. Nothing in the corner. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so very much for letting me be here with you. It was going to be along the same uh, street. I think it's like what a wonderful stuff, story. But, uh, what what a what wonderful change. series of stories. We're going to be with Eisenhower, and, uh, wherever they are. Well, we thank him. Yeah, That's so a, I have no such idea. powerful um, messages so here today. No. And. Um, look, he's already asked, getting people asking for his autograph on the book that is included in your um, in your welcome bag today. Uh, oh. Bill Cavanaugh, one more round of applause for Bill. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to uh, be setting the stage for our panel discussion here in just a moment. And uh, while we do that and get everyone up to the front, um, I again just want to thank you for being here and being on our Zoom call today. I'm Brad Furr from KJ Radio and K Desert Guide. And uh, I've been hosting this conference for a number of years and I'm proud to do so. Um, and proud to help bring this information to our community and bring these stories of hope and inspiration. And uh, and also bring the research update that we're going to have in just a minute. And um, again, as we get ready for our next session, I just again want to thank the various organizations that help bring this to our community. The HIV Plus Aging Research Project, our LGBT Community Center of Coachella Valley, Jewish Family Services, Brothers of the Desert, the Transgender Health and Wellness Center, LKA, Let's Kick Ass, the AIDS Survivor Syndrome, the Alzheimer's Organization, Parkinson's Research Organization, Desert Oasis Healthcare, Eisenhower Health, and DAP Health. And uh, those organizations help throughout the entire year, but especially uh, during this annual conference, which we've come to really expect and love here in our community. And again, our presenting sponsors one more time as we finish uh, getting everybody up on the stage. Avita, Bios Clinical Research, DAP Health, EML Serono, Gilead, Napo Pharmaceuticals, our friends at Palm Tree Clinical Research, PS Test, Thera Technologies, and Walgreens. And a reminder that we will be having lunch after this. Those of you on Zoom will uh, will will then rejoin us uh, after the lunch and part of our program today. And this afternoon, we have another session with our keynoter, and we're looking forward to that as well. And also, um, we'd like to remind you with my prop, my handy dandy prop of a Fire HD10 for those who um, will be filling out your survey at the end of the conference today. Um, you will have the chance to win one of two of those that we are giving away. Um, and the registration desk is where we'll be accepting those. Can the people on Zoom participate in the survey? Can they participate in the survey? Do we have a way to do that or not? Afterward, okay. Uh, we will, I think we'll be contacting them afterward as well. Okay. And are we ready for our session? Good. Well, let's welcome our team presenting our 2024 research update. If we can get everyone to come to the stage, Goku Marcos, Pharma D from Bios Clinical Research. Yay. And we're going to be, you can go on. What's that? They're going to present from the podium. So do you want me to introduce each one separately or, or everyone together? Um, yeah, do it, do it everyone together. Okay. Um, Dr. Ann Stapleton from Eisenhower cannot be here today. She's in uh, quarantine from COVID. 
Dr. Phyllis Ritchie from PS Test, Dr. Carlos Mar uh, Martinez from Palm, uh, Palm Tree Clinical, and Paul Edmonds, uh, the City of Survivor patient, who will be with us today as well. Okay, come on. Good morning, everyone. Let's see, I'm scared to move this thing. Yeah, not that sure. All right. Let me see if I can figure out how to move these slides. There you go. You're moving them. There's going to be a delay here, though. Yeah, but there's a significant delay here, so that'll be fast. Okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Golku Marcos. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Bios Clinical Research. I want to thank Jeff Taylor, Steve, um, everyone at HARP, and our community partners for really supporting Bios over the last couple of years, getting us off the ground and bringing these really diverse and wonderful trials for HIV and for PrEP to the community. I'm gonna spend some time talking about some of the work that we're doing, uh, but I was just thinking about the previous speaker and what he was saying about what gives us purpose in life. And um, without trying to get you know emotional, um, I think challenges in life really define us. And they give us a purpose, and so do the people in our lives. And um, everyone that I work with, I'm very, very grateful. Everyone in the community who we know as colleagues and friends, and some of you in the audience who are our patients in some of our trials, you give us purpose every day. And I'm so proud of the work that we're doing, and I hope that we get to continue to serve you with um, some of the wonderful studies that we have and opportunities for all of you. Um, in now or in the future. So with that being said, our vision really a couple of years ago, and I, I've done this last year and I think the previous year talk about this, and I think it's really relevant because it shows that we're moving towards the direction of achieving that goal and that vision is to establish clinical trial sites in regions where there are few opportunities for studies. And so we had our eyes set on Palm Springs. It's um, an area, of course, as you know, rich with folks who are living with HIV and those who are at risk for HIV. And I knew at that time that there weren't very many study opportunities at all. So I thought, hey, here's an excellent opportunity to set up a site and see what we could do with our network, with our connections, and, and bring those trials um, to town. And so our second goal as part of our vision was to partner with community organizations um, and uh, clinics that are managing people who are living with HIV or at risk of HIV. And so right now we have this wonderful partnership with Eisenhower Medical. We have other potential partnerships with other organizations in the works. And we are very excited because that enables us to make these clinical trial opportunities available to a wider um, range of, uh, of folks and, and gives more um, exposure to the trials uh, across the various clinics um, and community organizations in town. And so our third um, goal was to utilize our, our network within the industry to bring cutting edge trials um, for investigational new drugs. So that's the type of work that we're involved with. Um, I particularly have been in the area of HIV for over a decade. My team has been working in this area and been doing clinical research for as long as I've, uh, you know, as long as I have as well. And um, we we are have some really exciting trials, some really innovative medications. We are partnered with um, the top pharmaceutical companies, and so again, we'll spend some time talking about uh, what we have going on in a few minutes. This is our team. Not everyone's photo is up here. Um, this is a remarkable group of individuals. I will start out by saying Dr. Zed Shear and Dr. Gautier. These are the two kindest um, do uh, physicians that I know um, and who provide remarkable care to their patients as well as to our patients in our studies. They serve as principal investigators for us on all of our trials. So we are very fortunate to have them. They are both um, Eisenhower physicians. And then we have um, Joe Damon, nurse practitioner. A lot of you may know he's retired. Um, he's one of our sub-investigators. Again, very caring, kind um, provider. Patrick Shine, who's now up in Washington State. He works with us remotely. He's been instrumental in 
um, our trans community and he specializes in this kind of care. We had a uh, prep trial in which we needed diversity. We needed patients um, who were gender diverse and in order to have that, we wanted to have a provider who was um, very experienced in caring for this population of patients. So we've been fortunate with that. Angel is our admin. Kim, she is uh, a Wonder Woman. She does. She wears a woman of many different wears many different hats. Um, does outreach for us. She runs our lab. Um, she's been instrumental in bringing on a number of folks to our organization who have all been very successful with us. So we thank her, Leah, who it's she's not here today, but it all started with Leah and her experience running our trials um, and and her previous work at Eisenhower over the last decade doing clinical research. So she really runs the show. And of course, Bridget, whom I think you all know as well, um, we're fortunate to have her as our study nurse and our support. So thanks for bearing with me as I went through that. This is our site. I, I, sh I think I showed these pictures last year. Um, we strive to be uh, a place where people feel at home, doesn't feel like a doctor's office. Um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time renovating our office. We're at 1401 North Palm Canyon. Um, and I'll show you the um, address and contact information for us if you're interested in paying us a visit. So with that being said, I, I keep talking about, we have all these exciting studies. I wanted to give you an overview of what HIV treatment strategies look like now moving into the future over the next few years. We are seeing that there's a development of regimens that is around long acting regimens. So whether that be oral regimens or injectable regimens, and we have a wide array of new medications with new mechanisms of action. So these are entirely new classes of drugs that we haven't really seen before, um, which is also exciting. And then we've got our antibodies. And antibodies are part of cure research, but they're also part of treatment research. And so we're involved you see in all of these different types of treatment modalities, we're involved in a wide array of these across all of our trials. And we now have 10 studies, 10 active studies, I believe. And so we touch on almost all of these different treatment strategies. And so some of the things that we're doing that is really exciting, we are involved with long acting regimens. So currently we have once weekly oral regimens we have long acting injectable studies and infusion studies, particularly with antibodies. We have long acting injectable studies for PrEP. And then we've got simplification strategies. So I know a lot of uh, the folks here in this room might be on complex regimens. You might have a history of resistance um, and other reasons why you don't qualify for one pill once a day. Um, we've been able to enroll a high number of patients already. Come talk to us at the end of this if you're interested, because we'd have to screen you literally this week if you want to get into that trial. Um, but again, simplification strategies for patients on a complex regimen. So here's an overview of all of our trials right now. And I'm going to touch on some of these. The ones in red are the ones that we are actively enrolling. So Complex regimens is one of them. We've got a combination of Bictegravir and Lenacapavir. So again, thinking about not just long-term, um, long-acting regimens, but really simplifying the number of medications that patients are exposed to, removing an older class of drugs that has tends to have um, off-target effects, long-term adverse events, and really putting together two potent um, highly active medications together um, for individuals. And then lenacapavir is latrivir is again, another two drug combination, very focused um, uh, regimen that is once a week. We have another study called Wonders, which is another combination of two medications. They don't have, um, they don't have a name here, but it's different combination that is another once weekly regimen. We have an observational trial that is ongoing for patients who have multi-drug resistance. And then in the future, really, really exciting, we have been selected for cabotegravir, 
which is a long acting injectable for PrEP currently that's given every two months, it's going to be given every four months. So we have a lot in the pipe. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the agents that we're working with. And this is our trial. Um, it's called Embrace. We're not enrolling currently, but it will at some point in time move into phase three. And I wanted to talk about it. So in case anybody was interested in it, it's a combination of a broadly neutralizing antibody called N6LS. And it is combined with cabotegravir, which is a long acting injectable that's already on the market. That injectable is given once a month. This broadly neutralizing antibody is infused once every four months. The goal is to get the injection and the infusion to be aligned so that it's a once every four months treatment. So it will get there at some point. But the really unique thing about the antibodies that I mentioned to you, it works for cure and it works for treatment. This is a treatment study. This is a proof of concept trial that was done to show that the antibody works in reducing viral load. But what it also has been shown to do, and this has been across numerous trials, is that they found that some folks, these are each individuals and their viral loads that are decreasing. You see that some individuals actually maintain a suppressed viral load even after drug is withdrawn. So what that means is that this antibody is eliciting some kind of innate immune response that is enabling that individual's body and immune system to be able to naturally keep the virus suppressed. And so this is why and how antibodies, they don't quite understand the exact mechanism, but that is how it can lead to long-term cure strategies is this prolonged, what we call virologic suppression without the presence of medication. And so that becomes really, really exciting in the study that we're doing. Um, this is with Vive Healthcare and GSK. It is a combination of the antibody infusion, like I said, every four months, plus cabotegravir. Cabotegravir is a drug that's already on the market. It's given once a month. And like I said, eventually it'll be aligned so that the two medications are given once every four months. And we have um, three, three or four patients in the study, and most of them are doing really well. Um, it's well tolerated. Um, and you know we're we're very fortunate to have um, to have been able to enroll. The one thing about the antibody studies that you should know, not everyone qualifies because you have to be sensitive to the antibody. So there's a sensitivity assay that is done beforehand, and probably very likely as well, when it comes to market, that same criteria will be there in order to see if this medication or regimen would be right for you. Okay, so one of our newer trials, and this is a phase two slash three. So we just closed enrollment for phase two, but it will move into phase three sometime over the next six to 12 months. So something to keep your eye out for. It is moving individuals from Bictarvi over to a once a week combination. And I think probably when it gets to phase three, they may also allow individuals from other standard of care regimens, but for now it's just focus on Bictarvi. Um, and it's a combination of GS1720 and GS4182. 1720 is a new medication. It is a long acting integrase inhibitor. So we already have the integrase inhibitor class. If any of you are on TIVIK or Bictarvi or um, Icentris, that's, that's the integrase class. But this is a newer formulation that's long acting as an oral pill that can be given once a week. And that is combined with GS4182 which is what we call a prodrug of a medication called lenacapavir. And lenacapavir is also a relatively new drug. It came to market as the first in class capsid inhibitor. And so here we have a combination of two unique medications, both long acting, a capsid inhibitor and a long acting integrase inhibitor. Both are very specific to the virus itself and the viral life cycle. And like I said, um, the way that treatment is evolving is to become more specific and tailored to the virus rather than having 
um, off-target effects on other cellular mechanisms and other organ systems in the body. So exciting to see. We are just, um, you know, enrollment for this was really quick. We literally have two or three people that we were able to screen for the phase two, and then it'll hopefully open up for phase three and we'll be able to recruit more individuals. So if that's something that interests you, keep it in mind. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but just some of the criteria, you know, they want individuals who are undetectable and suppressed. One of the key things is not to have any integrase inhibitor class resistance. Um, all right. So we've got two more studies that we're about to start recruiting for, and these are in phase three. And they are also a, looking at a new investigational product of a once weekly regimen. Um, but the combination is different. And there are two different protocols because one of them, um, 5925, is a switch from Bictarvi, and 5926 is a switch from standard of care. So that enables individuals who are on other kinds of regimens to be able to switch off onto this combination. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. <laughs> Um, but most importantly, this is a combination of lenacapavir and islatravir. So we've already um, done the phase two, and um, that was a small study, but I can tell you that was life-changing. Uh, we have one um, African woman in this trial right now. Um, she, you know, we talk about this all the time, but we don't actually understand it till we see it in front of our eyes. A, a person who is um, feels like there's so much stigma around her condition. Um, she's afraid of anyone seeing her taking her medications. She's afraid of losing her job if anyone found out that she was positive. And just very depressed when she came in. And she's really become family to us. Her life has transformed with this once weekly regimen. And she just says it's so easy to take. It's a small pill. She doesn't have to worry about anyone seeing her taking her medications or knowing about um, her status. So for us to see that um, and see her actually transform from someone who was really down in the beginning to someone who's happy to come in and see us um, is really remarkable. So uh, well-tolerated regimen. Um, I would encourage, if you're interested in the once weekly, like I said, uh, we've got those two protocols that we're going to be um, recruiting for pretty soon. And then if you miss those, we'll have the phase three of the one that I mentioned before. Okay, artistry one, we're about to close this for enrollment, but I feel like a lot of folks in here might be interested. So if you are, please come and see me and we may be able to get you in for a screening uh, Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> I know it's, it sounds like a lot. I always say, I always encourage folks, if you feel like you're interested, just come in to get screened. We go over the study details with you. You can always withdraw consent if you feel like you don't want to um, go forward to the study. But this is for folks who are um, on complex regimens. And so this is for those of you who've been living with HIV for a while, maybe have gone through those early days, you have a history of drug resistance, you're not on a one pill once a day, and it's kind of complicated. You got a lot of, you might be on a boosted regimen like a Prescobix or a, um, a, a Rayataz, that kind of thing. You might be on you know, multiple pills multiple times a day. If that sounds like you and you want a one pill once a day option that's comprised of just two very focused medications, then this would be the trial for you. Um, I would say just as long as you have been undetectable over the last 12 months, that is a key criteria for entry into this trial, as well as on the same regimen for the last six months. And similarly, we have its sister study, Artistry 2, and this is for folks who are switching over from Bictarvi. And if I fail to mention, the combination here is, again, two drugs. It's Bictegravir and Lenacapavir, so two very focused, um, specific medications. And then um, really excited about this upcoming trial because we just, we were a high enroller for Lenacapavir for PrEP every six months. And now we have this new trial, Cabotegravir, every four months for PrEP. And um, you know, speaking from experience, I think both of these medications are remarkable. 
Um, they're administered differently. Lenacapavir is given subcutaneously in the fat tissue of the abdomen, whereas cabotegravir is given intramuscularly into the gluteus medius muscle. So slightly different, whether it's four months or six months injection, I think these are still just absolutely wonderful options. So if you want to go from taking a pill once a day of Descovy or Truvada to getting an injection every four months, or maybe you're not even on PrEP, this would be a wonderful trial to be a part of. It's going to be phase two, and then it will move into phase three. So if you don't make it for this early phase, there'll be opportunities to enroll later on. We've got an observational trial. So if you're someone who has multi-drug resistance, like I said, again, if you um, have been living with HIV for a while and you're you know, a little apprehensive about doing a drug study, you can do an observational study with us. And we'd love to collect your information, just see how your treatment has been managed over the years. And um, there's compensation associated with that. And so if you're interested or have any friends, colleagues, or anyone who might be interested in any of our trials or future studies, this is our information. Um, our team is in the back there. You guys wanna raise your hands? They don't want to raise their hands. <laughs> um, we got uh, Jada, Kim, and Justin. Um, I'm here as well for a while. If you'd like to speak with me, thank you again, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any, any questions for uh, Dr. Marcos before we go on to the next one? And like she said, there'll be plenty of opportunities afterwards to put that in the team. Next up, I believe is Carlos Martinez, right? Oh, we've actually done this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have done this. So welcome, Dr. Richard. Thank There's no introduction you. to this community. Thank Thanks, everybody. Um, am I supposed to do this myself? Which one is for the, um, the middle one? Like, like, the arrow. With the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Well, anyway, it's really a pleasure being here. And um, I... Um, I feel not great following these wonderful speakers in front of me. They were both uh, very good, and and I'm I, I I'm sorry I'm following them because they were just terrific. I'm going to do uh, uh, a short talk on um, the an STI update um, and what's what's new. And um, I had lunch yesterday with um, Jeff Bach and. Brett Klein, and I was told that my talk isn't completely complete, but my niece does my slides and it was too late for her to add. So there you go. <laughs> okay. So I'm at PS Test, I'm the CEO and founder. Just to introduce you to our medical director, we're so lucky to have Dr. Greg Kuldonik. Yeah. So basically, PS says just basically who we are, no-cost boutique sexual health care clinic, rapid test and treat for H HIV and hepatitis C. We test and treat for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. We administer doxy, pep, and pret, all at no cost. Sorry, it's a, it's a delay. Yes, delayed on your screen. Oh, on my screen. Oh, no, I'll just put up here. Okay. So um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start out by talking about um, the meningitis vaccines, and I'm going to give you a little background. There's two of them: the meningitis ACWI vaccine. It's indicated for 11 to 12 years old, 12 year olds, anyone in close quarters. There's also been multiple outbreaks amongst gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, mostly most recently in Florida, and sometimes recommended for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men when they're um, congregated in small areas. And the second vaccine that we're going to kind of focus on today is the meningitis B vaccine. It's usually traditionally recommended for adolescents 16 to 20, 16 to 23 in two doses. So the meningitis B vaccine to prevent gonorrhea, and that's what I want to focus on. So this just gives you an idea of what gonorrhea looks like in Riverside County. This is just until 2019. As, as you can see, it's just not come down. It just keeps going up. And if we extended that to 2000, I think they're up to 2021, it's gone up, it keeps 
does not come down. So I like this quote. It's not perhaps a coincidence that a men meningococcal B vaccine would be protective against gonorrhea as meningococcus and gonococcus are almost twins. And that's said by Sebastian Ford, the head of the Genital Dermatology and Sexually Transmitted Infection Unit of Paris St. Louis Hospital in France. So a retrospective study in July, 2022 showed that just one dose of the MEMB 4C was 20, vaccine was 26% protective against gonorrhea and two doses were 40% protective. That's, that's a game changer really. Um, and it's to me impressive. Um, and there's new, there has been new resistant gonorrhea in the United States. January 2023, the Massachusetts Department of Health found two unrelated patients with a new strain of drug resistant gonorrhea. Multiple antibiotics were found to be less effective against this strain of gonorrhea. This was the first time five different classes of antibiotics were found to be less effective against a strain of gonorrhea in the United States. Ultimately, both cases were cured with ceftriaxone, which is a drug we use, but they used a higher dose for, um, for these resistant cases. So these are just my thoughts about the MEMB vaccine for gonorrhea. And, and I would recommend vaccinating people at risk with the MEMB vaccine in, in Riverside County. I don't know why I said Riverside County anywhere, really. And, and who's considered at risk? And anyone that's sexually active with, with different partners that you don't know um, is considered at risk to get gonorrhea. So, so I, would, I would consider getting it. Will your insurance company pay for it? That's a bigger question. Some do, I, 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 I know that some do, you kind of, I don't know how that happens, but they do. Otherwise it is expensive. I think $400 a dose or for, and it's two doses, so it is expensive. So I wanna move on. And I know that most of you know about doxypep, we call it doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. Do most people know about that? Um, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> what is doxycycline? It's a great antibiotic. It's an antibiotic we use commonly around the world for various infections, bronchitis, um, pneumonias, um, relatively inexpensive. I travel with it. So if I get sick or my husband gets sick, we have something. Well, what's doxypep? If taken as directed, it decreases the incidence of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis by 65%, another game changer. You take 200 milligrams within 72 hours of condomless sex. Um, Paul Sandman, who works at our office, says within 72 hours of sex, condomless or not, because you really don't know if that condom's going to break. Recommended for gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, or transgender women. Not effective among cisgender women. It's still unclear to me why. I don't know, but there are studies being done. Dr. Luke Meyer, she is an original uh, researcher who did the study on doxypep. She says, I think we all view doxypep as part of a sexual health package, not as a standalone. I think of this as part of improving people's sexual health in general. That's what we think. We're doxy pet pushers at our clinic. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I want to talk about MPOX. This is a big deal. This has been in the news um, a lot lately. And, and, and a little MPOX update. So, oh, I have, oh, 1111. That's weird. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, number one, this is the second time in just over two years that the WHO has declared MPOX to be a global emergency. It's scary. It's coming, um, in my opinion, to everywhere. Uh, number two, the first MPOX outbreak in 2022 was caused by clade two. We all remember that, that one. It's, it was a milder strain and 99.9% .9 of people contracted it survived. You know, it was terrible things that people got. It was painful sometimes and disfiguring, but they, most everyone survived. Um, the strain causing the latest outbreak is caused by clade one, and clade is, is basically a strain. It's more virulent and deadly than the clade two strain, and some pr prior outbreaks of the clade one strain have killed up to 10% of those infected. So, I mean, if you think about it, 
in a room of 100 people, 10 of those died. The best way to prevent both clades of mpox is to get vaccinated with the Genios vaccine. And you can get it at the pharmacy now, um, but it's expensive. I just heard someone tell me it's four hundred dollars, four hundred dollars a dose um, at the pharmacy with insurance. So quite expensive. Um, Riverside County has some free clinics, but I I don't know where exactly. I think it's on. The Oh, great. Okay. And I think, I think it's on their website too. Yeah. So they did have a um, vaccination event uh, this past week at uh, the park on the 18th. Um, there's going to be another one, hopefully. Since we're working hard with the city to do one at Village Fest on uh, this coming Thursday. Um, so fingers crossed we can get that uh, pulled together at the very last minute. They denied our request initially. So I went to the mayor and we're trying to go top down to get them to uh, to allow this to happen. The reason uh, that we're trying to do all this now is the current uh, supply of free vaccines that the county has been giving out that they get from the feds, that's going to expire at the end of the month. So this is a big push to get everybody vaccinated uh, before the, the uh, 30th. So um, We'll send out an announcement uh, once we get uh, confirmation of the Village Fest. And then at APS Pride, the county is going to be there. I'm going to have more vaccines that they're giving out for free. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't been vaccinated, you can get your first one uh, next week at Village Fest. And then they recommend four weeks later. So that's pretty much Pride. That you can get your second shot. And if you've only gotten one shot, please make sure you get your second one because it really improves uh, the coverage. And um, I think many of us remember from two years ago, people posting on Instagram, you know, the horrible experiences they had. It ends up being kind of a genital and anal. And it, as you can imagine, you know, it's like chicken pox, but worse. And that's really, really painful and can be disfiguring. So uh, make sure you get vaccinated. Tell your friends about it. I think most people here probably did. But if you know people who are sexually active, um, let them know about it so they can get that protected as well. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say one other, I, thank you, but I, I was going to say one other thing um, to add on to what Jeff was saying that even if you only got one dose of the Genios and it's been way longer than four weeks, say it's been a year, you can still get your second shot. It doesn't matter how long it's been, you can still go and get your second shot. So, um, and I, it's important to get it done. Um, there's been breakthrough cases after um, people have gotten two uh, doses. Um, there was one in particular in uh, Chicago not too long ago where people were coming after having, some after having two doses, some after having only one dose. They were mild. So if you do get your two doses and have a breakthrough, it's always pretty much historically mild. Anyway, thank you. Are we taking, are we taking questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask, and then we'll move on to the next one. Yeah, and back here. One second. If you had your two already, do you need a booster? Oh, such a great question. And the answer is the CDC has not come out with any recommendations for that. I do just off the record. I know a lot of people that are get redoing um, their course of the MPOX vaccine. It's you know, it's I, the answer is I don't know. Um, I don't think off the record, I don't think it's a bad idea to get a redo of the MPOC series. Yeah, I've, I've heard that there's a, a UCLA researcher yeah. who's looking into this. So there may be some data coming out. Yeah. But like you said, I've had providers tell me, you know, who are gay and sexually active that they've gotten a booster I, if they're I, able to get it. I think I, I think it's a good idea, but that's just my, my the, the, totally my thoughts. Village Fest or Pride. Yeah. So and it's this free too. The Village Fest will be free, right, right, Jeff? The Village it's Fest will be totally free. Free, exactly. It'll be the yeah. supply of the yeah, county's free vaccine. That's a big deal because, again, with insurance, they're $400 a dose at the pharmacy for most insurance. Other questions? If not, thank you so much, Dr. Thanks. Richie. This thank is terrific. You. Oh, I'm, I'll, I'll just start talking. Yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> Dr. Martinez is well known to many, to all, all of right, us. So, so go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice being here again. 
I can't believe it's been nine of these conferences, actually. And for the last four, you guys have seen me with the face mask. So this is my face. Uh, I want my tombstone to actually read uh, Carlos party guy and not Carlos with the face mask. So I just uh, I just wanted to actually talk about a study that we're doing. Uh, we've been doing this study for a year or so. And it's just practically an, exp uh, I'll just extend a little bit on what Goku said. So practically we're, we're trying to actually get clinical research or HIV clinical research to have those long acting medications. Uh, but besides also having a long acting medication, we wanna have that medication that is actually going to be the only medication that you would have to take and nothing else. In other words, we want, we're actually trying to achieve that post treatment controller. Uh, that's one of, the, that's one of uh, the main focuses in HIV research to actually have that type of treatment. So this type of trial, that's what it's actually trying to do. It's trying to focus on getting patients to be post-treatment controllers. Um, and it's known, the sponsor calls it the next big uh, uh, thing in clinical research and HIV clinical research. Uh, we'll, we'll stay with that, but we're trying to actually get to the point where patients are post-treatment controllers. And uh, this clinical trial is being run by Dr. Ritchie. She is a principal investigator for this clinical trial, but also as sub-investigators will be Dr. Yunus. He is the, the infusion center. So this drug is actually infused. It's, two, it's a two combination drug and it's, it's infused and we have to do those infusions. It's I believe only eight times that you get the infusion. And after that, you get, you're get you practically taken off your, your um, antiretroviral since day one. You get you receive those eight infusions, and after that, we just follow you like hawks to make sure that your viral load doesn't spike up, and that your CD4 count does not start dropping. So that's what we do, and that's how we are trying to achieve those those post control uh, uh, treatment controllers. Um, the study has been doing good so far that they've extended the the uh, observation period to two years. Before it was a one year uh, uh, clinical trial, now it's two years. Um, so it's an infusion. Dr. Eunice is the one that's actually at the uh, infusion center in Palm Desert. And I am the other sub-investigator. And I'll have a little video for you guys to actually talk about the clinical trial. So I'll, I'll stop talking here and I'll let you listen to this. May I? Patients are being tested in this study to see if one or both are safe and effective in controlling HIV without ART. Once in the study, you'll need to stop taking your ART at the direction of the study doctor to begin the investigational medication. You'll have regular blood tests so the study team can monitor your viral load and CD4 levels. And if your viral load increases or you stop feeling well, the study doctor will have you restart your ART and continue in the study. To be eligible to participate, you must be 18 to 70 years old, diagnosed with HIV-1, on ART for at least 12 months, and on your current ART for at least eight weeks. You will also need to agree to stop your ART at the direction of the study doctor. If you're interested, the study doctor will review other requirements as well as potential risks for you. You may also leave the study at any time for any reason. While participating, all study-related treatment and medications are at no cost. Your participation may help improve medical knowledge about HIV treatment and patient care worldwide. Thank you for learning about the M19965 study. Um, if you guys have any questions or any, um, or if you're interested in this clinical trial, I'm right back there. Also, you guys can probably hear or listen to the advertisement that we're doing through KG. And so, yeah, if you guys are interested, please reach out to us and we'll answer any questions that you guys have. And I believe that is the hmm. last. Oops. So yeah, uh, that that's it for me. Any questions? <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you to all the doctors for the research updates. Now we're going to hear from um, 
if all everyone could go up to the stage and um we'll show a short video for uh paul edmonds the city of hope patient but if everyone could go ahead and take a seat up on the stage go ahead yes all of the doctors and paul we'll start with a um queue up the video once everyone gets seated and we'll get started I remember around the beginning of the 80s, people started getting sick. I was being called the gay cancer, and people started dying. There was a newspaper in San Francisco, and the uh, Bay Area Reporter, they published a bit too weird. We would all look at it every week and... Sorry. Within a few years, they discovered it was HIV. But until then, we didn't know what was going on. You know, it was very scary. I got tested and I was positive. My name is Paul Edmonds. I've had HIV for 30 years. I developed an AML and had a bone marrow transplant, and now my HIV and my leukemia are gone. As um, people living with HIV are living longer, there is an increased risk of developing cancer, and the idea that you can potentially treat their malignancy and their HIV at the same time, it's, it's pretty amazing. He was diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome. It's a bone marrow disease, but then transformed to something called acute myeloid leukemia. And that requires immediate treatment. We started standard treatment. Unfortunately, it did not work. So we did a more intensive regimen for him. And again, it did not work, which at that time was kind of critical when you have two lines of treatment and leukemia is still not responding. So we put him in an actually gentler treatment. He achieved what we call complete molecular remission and then we started the process for transplant. When I first met Paul, he was evaluated for a stem cell transplant for his leukemia and it came to my attention that they found a donor who carried this rare mutation, which basically makes people resistant to developing HIV. If a person has that mutation, it makes the virus unable to infect the cells. And then we started the process for transplant. ready with Dr. Addictor to start withdrawing his HIV medication. We monitored his blood every week to see if we could find any rebound of virus, and we didn't. Then we did even further deeper testing, and again, everything came back effectively negative. And so we've reached this point now, four years after his transplant, where we can't find any evidence of replicating virus in a system, and it, it gives me hope for what we might be able to achieve in the future. This only happened to a few people in the world. I, I remember uh, the Berlin patient, Timothy Ray Brown. It was, was hope for a cure uh, for HIV. Big reason I even want to tell my story is, you know, I want to bring some hope to people with HIV. And, I'm going to remember all those we lost. It's been the Berlin patient, the London patient, the New York patient, the Dusseldorf patient. And so what's remarkable was that this could be translated repeatedly in now the City of Hope patient. Um, 
Um, so before I'm going to ask Paul a few questions about the doctor that also grilled him if they like. But I did want to do a little uh, announcement for a City of Hope study that is a cure study that's trying to replicate what they did with Paul and Timothy. So instead of doing a full uh, stem cell transplant, what they do is have people come in and they get a mild um, course of, of chemo to bring down their immune system to make room for um, a new therapy that they're trying. What they do is they put people's own blood cells, find the stem cell, all about stem cells from donor, but this is using your own stem cells, so there's no chance of rejection or anything. And they take those stem cells in the laboratory, they modify them. They're called CAR T cells. You may have heard about them. They're um, part of the cure for leukemia. I'm not leukemia, for um, sickle cell uh, disease that has been very effective, but also very expensive. And so what they do is they take those cells, they genetically modify them, and then they get them to grow. So you have a lot. They infuse them back into the patient. And then once those are kind of there and doing what they're supposed to do, uh, they then give a CMV vaccine, which we may recall, CMV or cytomegalovirus is a disease that many of us had to fight in the early days of HIV. It killed a lot of people, but we all have this in our bodies. And so what the vaccine does is kind of wake up the immune system and makes those cells start to respond. And then when they do, the theory is that they will kill the HIV. So it's a really groundbreaking theory. Um, you know, investigational therapy that's going to be happening right down the road at City of Hope and also at UCSD. And Roberto, if you could raise your hand in the back of the room there. Um, he's visiting us from UCSD. They've already enrolled, I think, at least one patient, and uh, they're looking to enroll more. So he's got the materials on that study and also a sister study, um, CNTN, uh, for people who want to donate their bodies. Um, after death. Uh, a lot of us have heard about the last gift study that's happening at UCSD in San Diego. We don't have it here yet, but if you're interested in donating your, your body for HIV research, uh, talk to him and they do have a, uh, a study for that that he can enroll you in. So announcement's over. Now we can ask Paul <laughs> some questions about what you're like, what the experience was like getting the, uh, the transplant and what it means for your life now. Well, I, I'll just start off by saying purpose found the <laughs> right. I didn't really know what, what to expect, and I try not to have any preconceptions. I mean, I've always heard about how bad chemo is from people, but uh, it didn't seem to me as bad as I imagined it could be. But uh, it took a long time. I was in the hospital for five months. Wow. And then I had to stay two months near the hospital because this was too far away. Uh, the uh, the worst part of the chemo was, was the uh, uh, after the leukemia was in remission, the uh, the uh, chemo that uh, uh, took out my immune system before I got the uh, transplant. And that was why you had to stay in the hospital all those months, right? Yeah. Yes. Do the doctors have any questions? So. Yeah, I do because I know that you have um, to. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you you have um, different um, meetings or, or lectures on um, would you be asking HIV positive people if they'd want to be cured mm -hmm. and what's the answer and are you happy being cured is it well I, I am I am happy uh, you know it's taken me a while to get used to the idea and to believe it but I do uh, you know I like I said I I do have a purpose now. Uh, you know, I want to inspire people that there's hope and uh, inspire researchers and doctors. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. You know, I, I, HIV, the HIV community is going to always be my community because, yeah. you know, it, it has been for the last 36 years. Yeah, I think the thing to remember with the, the people who've been cured so far, that list of Dusseldorf, City of Hope, London, Berlin patients, now the Geneva patient just came out in the news. Um, they all had cancer and they would have died if they didn't get this procedure. There really wasn't a choice. Paul was right. Purpose found him. He had to do this. And, you know, it was lucky that it worked. It didn't, didn't work for everybody. Uh, the important thing to remember is this procedure can kill up to one third of the people who attempted. Um, so, you know, he was lucky. We're lucky to have him survive. And um, so, yeah, kids don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, Paul, one quick question. So besides all the positives that you just spoke about, and it's fantastic that you're cured now. Is there any negatives or have you noticed anything negative after being cured or, or any side effects that you have noticed or that are actually starting to show up? 
Well, I, I have some uh, grays versus host disease, graph versus host disease, uh, but it's pretty mild and manageable. I get some sores in my mouth. I have dry eyes. Uh, everybody in the has dry eyes. <laughs> 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 but I, yeah, yeah it, it really hasn't been, been too bad. Any other questions from the doctors? Otherwise, we can open it up to the audience, because I'm sure uh, we'll have questions for Paul as well. Anyway, yeah, we've got the microphone. Uh, gentleman right here in the center aisle. Somebody in the back there as well. So my question is really for all of you. Um, are these studies for people that are HIV positive and have just leukemia, or is it for people with HIV and any kind of cancer? So the study at City of Hope is just for people with HIV. Um, if you have cancer and HIV and have the same experience as Paul, the first thing they do is try the standard regimens. And then like, you know, they described in Paul's case that those don't work. Then the last resort is doing a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. Um, and, and the reason they do that is because, you know, it can kill you, uh, one in three. So um, that's why they do it that way. All the other studies that they were talking about um, earlier are for anyone living with HIV or people who don't have HIV who want to prevent it with PrEP. Is, is there any correlation between HIV positive patients and cancer? Yes. Yes, there, there is. Lymphomas, um, they say that cancer is more prevalent as you age with HIV. So there definitely is um, an association. Yeah. But long term survivors with HIV are at a much higher risk for all kinds of cancer. And the lymphoma and leukemia are two that we remember in the early days. And fortunately, there's a lot less of them, but still, we're at much higher risk than the average person if you're living with HIV. Cool. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I see one back here. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, Paul, have you met your donor? or any interaction with them? Yeah, I, I have not. I sent my donor, I thank you letter, but you know, it's completely their decision whether they want to remain anonymous or not. I would love to meet, meet my donor, but uh, so far I haven't. So do you also know if they've shared any information about what, by him donating his um, 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 transplant has has have they shared any information to him about what he has actually um, done for you? I, I I'm not I'm not sure. I don't. I imagine that they have, but uh, I'm not sure. Well, if you sent them a letter, right, they would know. Well, right. Yeah. Right. Are you still on um, immunosuppressants? I I am not. <laughs> Are you on any other meds that you have to take for as well? Well, I, you know, I've got a high cholesterol and blood pressure. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've met macular degeneration. <laughs> All the old man drugs, I call that. Well, I have a, qu a question for you, Paul. What words of advice or encouragement would you give our audience and those listening in who might be interested in participating in clinical trials or might be on the fence about that with regards to HIV? studies or prep studies well you know i uh, you know it, it's of course a personal decision uh but uh, you know i my 30 years with having hiv i got into many studies i looked for them early on i tried to do everything i could i wanted to survive so you know it's a little different now uh because uh, the medications are so good uh, it's not like it was early on uh, yeah, I would encourage encourage everyone to uh, check it out. So, you know, to Kevin's question about uh, meeting the donor. Um, so one case where that has happened is the Dusseldorf patient. His name is Mark Franca, and um, he reached out to his donor in the same way. Again, it's anonymous. They can, you know, uh, go public if they want to. She decided to. Her, her name is Anya. She's a retired flight attendant, and she has traveled with him. Uh, we met her in Munich for the uh, World AIDS Conference uh, this past July. A lovely person. And she tells her story of how, how wonderful it is to be able to help someone. Um, so yeah, that story is out there. And then a little plug, we're going to bring Mark Franca to Palm Springs for World AIDS Day. So our world annual Timothy Ray Brown Community Cure Symposium is going to happen on December 1st. Um, and uh, Mark will be there along with Paul. 
talking about their experiences, as well as one of the doctors from City of Hope will talk more about this study and how people can get involved. Paul, well, how often do you go back now? Do you go back to get started? Yeah, I've I finally gotten there once every six months. Mm -hmm. I, in the beginning, it was once a week, then went to once every two weeks, then once a month, then three months. Now I'm at six months. How long did you wait after the procedure before they said it was okay to, to start drugs? Did you start when they said it was, or did you wait longer? I waited longer. I, I The initial plan was to uh, stop the uh, HIV meds a year after the transplant and COVID came along. And, uh, you know, there was some talk that HIV meds might be offering some protection. So I just didn't want to stop them until I could get vaccine for COVID. Mm -hmm. So I waited two years. And then when you stopped them and um, you found that you didn't need them anymore, did you have any other or just in disbelief, or well, yeah, of course, there, there's been some disbelief, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I still take a ton of pills. I've taken a ton of vitamins for years, and uh, you know, I, I take meds for all my other things. So it just meant taking away uh, two pills. I think is what I was taking. Can, can you just tell us the day or the moment when you were told you don't have to take your HIV medications anymore? How you were feeling? Well, you know, I, they told me that at the end of a, a year, uh, you know, I, they didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to believe it until I knew for certain. And, uh, you know, they waited a year to tell me that. But I was testing negative the whole time. But was there a feeling that you had the day that you stopped taking your medications? Well, I... It, there was a confirmation, I think. I, I, you know, I started believing that this is real and it's happening, but uh, they confirmed it. So are you testing HIV negative or oh, yes. uh, total HIV negative? Yes. So antibody negative, too. Antibody negative. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions for Paul or, or for any of the doctors? Yeah, right if you're in front. So you're, you're HIV negative. If you go wait for the... Uh, microphone so the people on Zoom can hear. Thanks. I was going to say you're in remission for cancer and HIV. So how's your immune system? Are you considered Im immunologically compromised as far as vaccines and things? Or do you have a fully functioning immune system? I, I've, I've got a fully functioning immune system. I had to, uh, a year after the uh, transplant, I had to redo all of my vaccines, my childhood vaccines, everything. So I don't even remember how many I had, but I had a lot. <laughs> I had a lot. But yeah, a question up here. Go ahead, Jen. So this might be personal. First of all, congratulations to you. Thank you for what you do, what you are standing up for. I was in the room when that question was answered and was surprised at the answers I received to would you take a HIV cure or not? So, mm. um, so my question is, which might be a bit personal, but if this applies to you, what type of preventive preventative do you use? Uh, if you well, prayerfully, you are still sexually active. I'm saying because, you know, according to some people, after 65, people don't have sex. Right. So, you know, right. as an individual I, who's HIV negative now, what type of preventative measures do you use? Well, I, I, I my, my husband, we've been together for 32 years. Uh, so, and we're in a monogamous relationship. Uh, he's on PrEP. He's HIV, not on PrEP. He's on HIV meds. Uh, so, you know, I'm protected there. And also it's HIV-1 that I'm immune to. And we did, they did test to see what he had and he had HIV-1. That's great. Well, thank you again, Paul, and all the doctors and everyone for all your great questions. I know it's lunchtime and we don't stand up. stand up between you and that. And if Brad has a few more announcements before we have. Great. Yes, thank you very much. It's uh, lunchtime now and a couple of announcements before we break for lunch. Um, Aspen Mills is once again being served in the dining room down the hall, and the dining room is finished this year, so it's in great shape. Thank you to uh, Mizell. Um, there is a menu posted, so please make your choice before approaching the table where our amazing volunteers are waiting to serve you. 
Also, please make sure to visit all of our sponsor and community partner tables. They are located throughout. Uh, they are also in the back of our room here as well. And bon appetit. We are back for the uh, Positively Aging Project ninth Annual Symposium on Living and Thriving with HIV, featuring many keynote speakers and presentations for those people who are watching us on Zoom this afternoon. This year's um, a theme is Legacy, Inspiring Stories of Thriving with HIV, and we certainly have had some wonderful stories this morning leading into our lunchtime, and now we are back from our break for the second half of our symposium today. Um, we have a special panel speaking about their experiences thriving with HIV over the decades, and this will be by decade, so we have everyone in order. Uh, but, well, let, let's start. Jen Lothridge. And uh, Jen, next to you is the birthday woman. <laughs> Benita Reyes. Look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. this was not my thought. It was the thought of our committee. So, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Jack Bunting is here as well this afternoon. And Dee Calvet as well. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Mr. Jeff Taylor, Executive Director of HIV Plus Aging Project, Aging Research Project. Jeff. Great. Thank you, Brad. And thank you to all of our panelists for, for agreeing to do this. Uh, you know, we talk about legacy and all of us have our own, as we heard this morning, all of us have our own legacy of living with HIV, either personally or vicariously through those who've known and loved over the decades and, you know, have seen how it's, um, evolved over the years fortunately so we're uh, really really delighted to hear um from everyone so uh first off i'm going to ask just a series of questions of all the panelists um to kind of tell us your own experience so we'll start with benita so what was it like when you i mean i'm not benita with the gen mother i'm sorry <laughs> yeah i got order, order, order right so we'll start with the baby of the group miss <laughs> jen lothridge um so tell us first a little bit about yourself where you are what you do currently and then if you could tell us what it was like for you when you first got diagnosed, what the, that news was like for you. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Lothridge. I uh, am a social work and gerontology student at SDSU University. Go Aztecs. Right. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm getting used to throwing that in there. Uh, anyway, so I work at an agency in San Diego called Christie's Place. We are an organization that serves women, children, and families, and individuals that identify as female that are living with and are impacted by HIV. I serve as the aging and research program supervisor there, basically working with uh, women that are uh, not only aging, but thriving with HIV, and also promoting the importance of participating in research regardless of your HIV status. So uh, when I was sitting in the room at Planned Parenthood because I just wanted to get my birth control updated and my birth control was fine, but what the heck, you're here, and let's go ahead and update your STDs. Why not? That's the norm, right? So they took a little bit to come back in the room, and I just chalked it off to, wow, they must really be busy today. And uh, finally, uh, the technician came back into the room, and she told me that my uh, results to the test were reactive. And so at that point, I tell people if there's a such thing as the deer in the head like look, I definitely had it because all I could do was just sit there and look at her as I'm taking in this information that she is telling me. So yeah, is that good? Yeah. There's more to come, right? So I'm dumbfounded. Just the yeah. beginning. <laughs> Should be talking into my microphone. <laughs> so next, from the birthday girl, Benita, if you could tell us a little bit about you and then uh, what that was like with, for you, your first experience. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Benita. Um, I just graduated from Cal Baptist University last month. Was my <laughs> last month was my uh, master's in psychology. I want to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. I want to talk to all of you. And um, 
Oh, what was that? Uh, and I've been working in mental health. I work with, uh, in a hospital, an acute psychiatric unit. I've been there for 18 years. And um, yes, now I'm here. Now I'm here telling my personal story. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> 2007. In 2007, when I found out after my mom had just passed and after I had just walked out of a, a 15 year marriage. And um, the doctor, the doctor told me she she was really, uh, really, really nice. That's what I was looking for was some Kleenex. I know I'm a cry. And uh, she the doctor told me, you know, my status, she said, your your test came back. Uh, positive and I immediately thought I was 39 years old 39 years old when I found out my status and I immediately thought um you, you, there's a mistake I've been married for 15 years there's a mistake go figure how right you know so I was just like you said Jen in a deer in her headlights and I proceeded to live um, 10 plus years after that in darkness. And I'm just now telling my story for the first time. <laughs> yes, yes. And I thank God that I'm here. And I thank all you guys for welcoming me, for being here for me. And I'm here for the rest of the long run. You know, um, I've always been an empathetic and compassionate woman. And this this whole the legacy this is it this is this is my purpose he just uh, steve or jeff said my, the purpose found me yep my purpose found me i know where i belong now this is where i belong you guys are my family thank you so much for sharing that for joining us right for, for doing this and having part of our community and sharing your strength and your resilience we really appreciate that and many birthdays to come. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Next up, uh, Mr. Jack Fonte. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here and for having me. Um, oh, you touch it. What do you? Can you help me? There it is. Is it on? Yeah, it's a switch. Can you hear me now? No. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me. And um, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for this beautiful energy and Benita, your story. I do know what it's like to live in darkness with my HIV, um, hoping and yearning to feel okay again, the way I did before it all started happening. Uh, for me, a little bit about me, I live here with my husband. Um, we've lived here for about 10 years now. My background is in communications. Um, about seven years ago, I got passionate about health equity and being a communicator um, for health and health equity. Um, Currently, I'm working on my master's in public health, uh, Cal State San Marcos. Go, and this is kind of sad, but guess what the mascot is? Cougars. So it's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm a cougar now. Okay. Um, anyways, guys, bad to the, to the difficult part. First of all, I've never opened with my HIV status unless I'm working with folks. Talk. I'm usually the one on the other side of the camera or the microphone, but this time I'm pushing myself to be more authentic with my experience. And so for me, it was 1997, I was 27. Um, I was living up in the Bay Area in San Jose, going to San Jose State University, having an affair with my boss that went on for three years. Um, and in a very um, hoity-toity restaurant that enabled me to be a full-time student and work part-time and feel really sexy because I was doing it with a boss who was also very sexy. Um, yeah, it was awesome. And, um, or so I thought. And um, we, I came back from a trip and there were telephone calls. Rob's in the hospital and I call him and I'm like, honey, what's going on? <laughs> and um, he's like, get tested. And I, I, I started walking around my apartment very quickly doing circles because I was the careful one. I was the smart one. Um, I had figured out how to have a good time in the 90s, which was just really traumatizing. We weren't even, we didn't even know we were traumatized. But even trying to have sex and be a young man in your 20s and honor your youth, um, I thought I had it figured out. Anyways, um, I figured out that having oral sex over and over again for three years and being the receptive person mm. is how I got it. Um, because we were always so careful about anal sex. 
Um, I can't prove that. I'm not a clinician. I'm an, I'm not a researcher. Um, but that's for me um, was my truth. Um, fast forward so much later, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say now other than that phrase, keep showing up, it gets better. It's so true. Um, so for me now, I'm aging with HIV. I'm 54. Um, I've had some great luck. I've made some good choices. I've made some sacrifices for my health and um, I'm okay now, but I'm still living with a legacy of skin cancer. I just had a very serious operation for it. That's in the back of my mind that could take my life later on. All these things we're hearing about. Either way, I'm here and I'm here to be with you guys. And I'm here to tap into the collective energy of how we can continue to live with HIV and not let it make life hard, but tap into the strength it can give us and still go on and live full lives. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Jack. And next, uh, we'll order your survivor. We'll hear from Ms. Lee Kalman. Thank you. Do you think I have a great smile? Yes. 40 years ago, we couldn't go to the dentist. Mm. They wouldn't take us. 40 years ago, we didn't have HIV. We had ARC. 40 years ago, we had the gay plague. Everywhere we went. I'm 75 years old now. I don't retire. <laughs> I just keep doing one profession and moving into a new profession. I now work at DAP Health. After being a minister, entertainer, blah, 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 blah. I know what it's like to be in the dark. I've only take, been taking meds for 15 years. Mm -hmm. For the first part of my journey, after being told that I was had this arc, and then later on HIV and the plague, and even the local restaurants where we would go, people would come and say, you know, we're not serving your, your, your kind because wow. nobody knew how you got it. Mm -hmm. And even in the gay community, because I identified as a gay boy at that time, even you would walk into a gay bar, you, you don't hug, you don't touch, you don't kiss, you don't do, your, your life completely shuts down now. Mm -hmm. Somebody said to me at lunch, they said, well, why did you wait so long about <clears throat> taking meds? I could not handle the stigmatism of what it was like 40 years ago to walk into a doctor's office and the look, you know that look? Some of you know that look is like, Nobody has to say anything, but he said, look. Mm -hmm. And that look that your friends give you, that look. Every single day, we were going to a celebration of life. Mm -hmm. We saw the quilt here earlier. And I was saying to Stephen, I said, I remember when it was several football fields and I remember I had put off seeing it, and I was in uh, Moscone Center in, LA, in uh, San Francisco, and I'm coming down the escalator, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm finally going to see this now. And I walk in, and where my toes were, I knew the person. 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 Dancers, singers, actors, writers, beautiful people. And I was still alive. So what was it like when I was told? I'm not quite sure because we didn't really know what it was. We just knew that we were going to die. And you would get a little cold. And you were happy if you woke up the next morning because your life, my life was so 
traumatic. You have a, I had a friend, and I'll end with this one, but I had a friend, uh, hairdressers of stars. We used to meet for cocktails on Friday, right? A bunch of us. And I said, oh, where's Ronnie today? Oh, he had to go to Kaiser because he got the flu. Oh, I've got a gig tomorrow night. I, I'll, I'll see him Sunday. Sunday, he was dead. His parents could not get a mortuary to take his body 40 years ago. His parents, who were good church-going people, could not get the church to let us have his celebration of life in the church. We went to the city to have a service in the park. We were denied having a service in the park because we were part of those kinds, the ones with the plague, the ones with that were that were lepers. So we ended up because being an ordained minister, they said, could you do the service? We ended up doing a small service in the home of the parents. Wow. Story after story after story. My friend Stevie went in the hospital with a cough. His family still haven't collected the body. And this has been 40 years. I went into the hospital, have no idea to this day whatever happened to his body. That was 40 years ago. Wow. So many stories. Yeah, thank you. I mean... <clears throat> You know, people forget that uh, those of us who were diagnosed back then before 1995, we were literally told, and this, this was my experience as well, you know, you have the virus that causes HIV and AIDS, you have about two years to live, go home and start making arrangements. So it really was a death sentence at that time. And I think, you know, we, we need to remember that. But, and that's why many of us are so traumatized uh, all these years later. So you spoke so much so eloquently about the stigma that happened back then. So for, for all of us, you know, it's, stigma has not gone away, unfortunately. You talk about some of the stigma you've experienced either with friends and family or through work or for healthcare. Any of those? So, uh, Jen? Um, so being the baby of the bunch here, um, uh, this, what, this November will be six years that I have been living with a di uh, actual AIDS diagnosis. Um, but now I'm U equals U, HIV positive. I'll say it like that. Um, so I have yet to experience a lot of stigma and especially really ridiculously inconsiderate rude stigma. Um, I think as our uh, Benita and I are talking twice so far, I experienced uh, a stigmatized reaction after someone has learned of my uh, status. And it's just interesting uh, of, to see the need of education. We know so much about so many other things, what they do on TikTok, what they do here, what they do there. But yet when it comes to something like HIV, people are clueless. So, yeah, I guess I haven't experienced as much, but <laughs> give it time. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good thing. <laughs> We're glad that all the work that people have done over the decades has helped uh, people come along later. But, yeah, how was it for you? Um, this is what helped, where I work at is what helped me come out. Um, I work in a hospital. <laughs> So I was, my fear was that they find out I got this, that I, I'm going to lose my job. I can't let these people know that I'm going to lose my job. So that's where the darkness really began. I had just found out when I got hired there. So um, years in, when, when patients would come in, when patients would come in, the nurses, the staff, uh, be careful, that person got HIV, be careful, be careful. Be, make sure you got your glove, be careful, be careful. And I would just be like, Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll be careful. <laughs> and it happened back after back every time. So for years, years I watched that and it let me know where I was at. And I was just, I would ask God, why, why did you have me here? <laughs> you know, um, so, so a situation happened where one of the employees, one of the staff nurses got sick. And another nurse had to do actually CPR and save this person's life. That's what got me. I'm like, you know what? 
I got to tell somebody in case something happened to me at work. It was all about me being worried about myself now. Mm -hmm. I didn't care what you thought. You know, I said, somebody going to have to know that in case something happens to me. And I was just telling Jen outside, you know, because she's been texting me all day, one of the nurses that I work with. Um, happy birthday, happy birthday. This is your opening moment. And um, I grabbed her one time in the parking lot because I knew she was a real nurse. I felt her empathy. I felt her compassion. And I knew she wasn't going to judge me. I just randomly, and, and she was like a deer with headlights. I randomly was like, hey, girl, I just want to let you know if anything happened to me at work, I made y'all be positive. Would you help me? And she was just like, okay. <laughs> But that's really how I, that's, that's really what I had I did, you know. So slowly and, and slowly over the years, um, I told my boss, I started telling people because I got tired of living in darkness. I got tired. I, I, I had to get to the point where I didn't care what you thought, say what you want to say, whatever, you know. Um, this is my life. I got to live it. You don't. And... Um, so today I'm still going through that, you guys. You know, my boss knew I was coming here, you know? And so, because everybody's like, what you gonna do for your birthday? I thought I'm telling my story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question that was on there was like social, um, the other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is it. You know, I, um, there was, there was times that I did open up to people that I, women that I thought was my friends, people I thought was my friend. Hmm. That's what kept me in darkness another two, three years. You know, um, I got, I'm a very authentic person, so I knew eventually, I was like, how is this going to end? Because I don't like, I, you know, I cannot, I didn't like living like that. I couldn't take it. You know, so here I am. Great, thank you. You know, and it's that courage that really uh, <laughs> makes it all better, right? Yeah, I, I have to, to share a little story. You're talking about working in a hospital. You know, in the 80s, I was in college and had to drop out because of my health, and I was working at a hospital. And it was, they literally would fire people. This is in Chicago, if that they found out. And um, it was also the, Middle of the crack epidemic in Chicago, and all these babies were coming in. And the moms would come in. They were often, you know, drug users living on the street. They give birth, and there was one little baby. And the ones who turned out to be tested positive, and it got positive, it maybe that they weren't, but they wouldn't know for a number of months. They would just have them in the hospital, and so they became what they called border babies and would live in this unit for months on end. Wow. And every once in a while, I would work over on the pediatric, pediatric side where these kids were. I'll never forget. It's the same thing. That baby has the AIDS. It was the AIDS. It was the AIDS. Stay away from it. They would not come in from Lennon's. They would take the food outside. The garbage would pile up. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I get for clapped every time I tell this story. This poor little baby, beautiful little boy, would just fall his eyes out because nobody would come in and interact with him. He was just being completely isolated, neglected, and ignored. And so I would come in for you know my 12-hour shift. First thing I would do was go into his room. He would stop crying. His face would just light up because another human being was coming into the room to acknowledge him. Soon I'd give him some, some affection that he never got. Sorry. <laughs> so what I would do was I would take him, put him on my lap for the entire length of my shift. And the nurse would go, oh my God, you know that baby has the AIDS. And it's like, yeah, it's fine. I don't have a cold or anything that could infect him. You know, these were nurses. They should have known better, right? Right. And uh, he was, I mean, just sit there and gurgle and, and poo and giggle and laugh the whole time. He, you know, he was young and he was not even two. He couldn't talk yet. But he would just sit there and be so happy. You know, and my job was to answer the phone, right? He'd start cooing into the phone. It was just, just amazing to see, you know, what a little bit of love could do to brighten somebody's life. And it really reminds us of how terrible it was. And even people in healthcare, who should know better, yeah. were treating people terribly. Right. There's so many stories like that. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah. 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 And Jeff, unfortunately, I don't think it's gotten super better. I mean, it's gotten better. Mm -hmm. We don't have, you know, nurses saying stuff like that about HIV positive babies anymore. Um, but, you know, I, and I'm not comparing myself to a baby who was left like that. So <laughs> let me clarify. However, today, if we're talking about stigma in healthcare, 
you know, I didn't go to the dentist for three years here because I got vibed so weird by my dentist because I had the temerity to be open about my HIV status. Um, it's happened a couple of times with dentists. And um, yeah, it really sucks. <laughs> it still happens. Or, um, you know, going to urgent care, and I won't say what place it was, but um, having a doctor who I'm not sure it wasn't just a veterinarian, um, you know, look at me like a real, like, a, I just look at me in the face and says, we don't do AIDS care here. And, you know, because of my experience of almost 30 years of living with this, I'm kind of at a bitchy level now. <laughs> me too. I'm kind of like, and I said to him, you know, it's 2022. You need to learn your vocab. <laughs> and I know I walked out and then there was another doctor at an urgent care, um, <clears throat> you know, extolling the virtues of Donald Trump and um, telling me, and this is during the pandemic, um, how masks are ridiculous and he won't, and his was down. And um, just going on, keeping me um, kind of trapped <laughs> um, because he knew I needed my medication. Um, that's an instance of when, you know, getting healthcare out there, quote unquote, where you expect healthcare workers to be kind of silly and just mm -hmm. not, not who they should be. What I want to touch upon as well, what about healthcare settings um, that are put on when you go to a healthcare setting and it's an actual ASO and you know those people got up that morning wanting to give love and good care to people with HIV, but still there's instances of stigma and discrimination and being poorly treated, even by people who are trying to do their best. Um, that too has really been difficult for me at times. Um, but here's the thing, I, I knew that I needed to get my needs met as a person with HIV, I needed to walk out that door with my care continuum being satisfied, even though I'm terrified that they don't know what they're doing and they've given me bad advice or they've treated me like I'm I'm eating too much from the trough, so to speak, as if it's, um you know, I've taken more than my share when in reality, I'm just asking questions. Those issues, um, it's the ASO organizations and the folks who are really really trying to do good change I really get inspired to have patience with them and to not take it personal um, and to not just be a complainer because that doesn't always help teach people either. Um, but I've been very, very traumatized by health related stigma. Um, and it's been very, it's kept me out of care. It's caused me to not get care all until I look in the mirror and say, hey, now you're being the dick. <laughs> get back in the game, buddy, you know, make some appointments. Um, but it's very real and it's, and it's not necessarily getting better because they say that people are getting, getting less intelligent. So, I mean, sh we should all be prepared to constantly deal with this in healthcare, but also have grace when it happens to us. Try not to take it seriously. There might be folks out there and it's really bad and you really do have to elevate it and fight back and advocate for yourself. Um, of course, those are situations that happen, but for me, my eyes are on the prize. It's, I don't want to die from HIV disease if I can help it. So um, that, being at that, you know, being at the intersection of being a warrior like that, but then being this person who has been truly traumatized over 30 years, um, it, it's it's a delicate balance. And, and it's it's getting better, though. Yeah, you know, we talk about stigma, and there's more than one. There's not just HIV stigma in the world, right? We, we all have to deal with lots of stigma. There's racism. There's homophobia. There's transphobia. Yeah, there's a lot to deal with. It's not just that, unfortunately. Where did it work? So when did I come out about the HIV? In the year 2000, I was a motivational speaker, well-known in my circles, and a drug addict. Mm -hmm. The darkness of keeping a secret keeping a secret life finally caught up to where I could talk the talk. I couldn't walk the walk. I could do cognitive behavioral therapy and, and get y'all going and, and y'all would be on your way. But I was empty inside. There was a hole. There wasn't a smile from the inside out. So I continued on the drug journey and the drug addiction journey led me to 
the HIV mm -hmm. coming out. There's a gentleman that wrote a book called uh, uh, HIV Positive, Nicholas Snow, mm -hmm. who a lot of people know. He's uh, an entertainment uh, person that I've known. I have known for years. I knew him from notes from Hollywood. I've known him. We've, we've known each other and known of each other for years. I read his book. I sat there and I cried. I read his book. I sat there and I cried. I read his book again. And I sat there and the tears were flowing from my face. And I said, if he has the courage to come out about his HIV, then I have nonetheless the same courage. So in 2005, 2006, to a readership and listening ship of about 100,000 people on social media, I came out about being HIV positive. And I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I mean, we talk about stigma, and that kind of leads into, um, you know, what we experience as, as survivors, that all of you are. And there's this term out there called AIDS survivor syndrome, which is a very specific form of PTSD that we have. I have gone through a war. We talk about people who have PTSD going through a war. Well, we have too. But it's a war that's lasted for 40 years. And maybe the dying stopped in 1996 when the meds came out. Not for some people, but people are still dying. And we're still experiencing stigma living with HIV. It's just not been an easy, uh, an easy road for many of us. So, if you could speak to what that's like for you, what kind of, uh, you know, syndrome or PTSD uh, you might be experiencing as part of your diagnosis. Um, I would think the the PTSD that I would acknowledge is sitting in a a room for almost forty five minutes waiting for the person to come and give me the results of the finalized blood test to confirm that I was in fact HIV positive. Um, that was a long time to be sitting in a room waiting to get information that you pretty much already knew anyway. Um, that was traumatizing. I mean, my feelings about that. Um, however, one of the things about understanding um, what other individuals that have paved this way before me, thank you very much. Um, I recognize that I can't keep quiet. So this year for my 50th birthday in March, I decided to tell the whole entire world that I'm living with HIV. And I, because I recognize well, the reason why people think what they think is because we're not talking about it. No one's talking about it. And if no one's talk of, talk, talking about it, then they only have the information that they have or choose to have, right? Because we all have the free will to gain knowledge, you know, and educate ourselves. Uh, so I realize that in order to help reduce the stigma, I must get louder than stigma. If we start opening our mouths and saying more information, informative things, oh, we used to take 50,000 pills a day, but we take one. Some people just get an injection, you know, just to help people understand the progress that has been made. And, oh, it's not as bad, you know, that you have HIV. Oh, you fart too? Yes, I fart too. <laughs> you know, to show people that we're the same because what I'm learning is if you if you're living with HIV, you're now different. You know, at one time I considered myself, I was just sharing with Benita as contaminated. I was biohazardous and um, I had to get through that. But once I realized, okay, if I start opening my mouth and sharing information and um, showing people that, okay, five years, I'm a baby, yes, but you know what, it still sucks. It doesn't matter how many years you have or have not been living with HIV, if you receive that information, it does something to the wiring in your brain, right? So it's just important that we make that effort to do our part to educate others, extend grace, because sometimes maybe people, you know, they live under a rock, maybe. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, you want to extend that grace because it always, it always matters about the intent that some people have. Sometimes they may say something and they don't have that. That's just ignorance. They don't have an intentional, um, an intention to be evil or heart, heart, 
hurtful, sorry, thank you, hurtful. Um, but yeah, so I just think it's important that we all continue to have this courage to stand before others, not worrying about what they think about us, how they view us, that's their business. That's not our business, right? We know how we have been living our lives and we wanna help others have a better life that are living with HIV. Thank you. <laughs> um, PTSD, yeah. Um, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still there with it. I'm, I'm still there with it. Um, it affects me every, every day. Every day, I'm feeling it. You know, whenever, I, whenever I go to work, you know. Um, to deal with me coping with that is being here with you guys and telling my story. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of me dealing with it, talking about it, de therapy, therapy. Um, but I, I deal with it every day. Um, uh, something I was just thinking about whenever she was talking uh, that I haven't, that I wanted to say is um, all these years since 2007, um, my son, my 32 year old son lives with me and I have yet to tell him Mm -hmm. I have yet to, I know he knows from my sister, my, I told my daughter and I know she told him, but he's never heard it from my mouth, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, but I know he knows that I can tell the way he takes care of me, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, and I was just asking, I'm like, that's PTSD, how come I ain't told my son yet and everybody else know, you know, I have to ask myself that I think is the PTSD part of that, yeah. you know, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the big fear is what is everybody else going to think? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Jack. Yeah. The, the problem with PTSD and me is that maybe it's because I identify so male and we're not good at admitting that we're fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I, you know, when I got it, you know, someone, someone said, oh, now there's parades and inhibitors, don't worry about anything. Well, that's BS too, because... I waited 10 years to take medication because it was still so toxic and all these awful things that you have to deal with, especially in that era with having HIV, you also got the messaging. You have nothing to complain about. Stop complaining. Get on with your life because you don't have to die from this. Although you might, and we're not really telling you anything. About um, so I, you know, I'm really like the king of denial. I have to admit that. Um, but also PTSD for me has made me um, hyper... Um, it, maybe it's made me a little defensive at times. Um, maybe defensive at times. Depression has gave way to anger or just not going to take it anymore. Overly hyper vigilant. Mm. But that can be some toxic shit too, and that can get a fella into trouble. So it's all about checking yourself before you wreck yourself, and um, not always doing a good job of it. But for me, PTSD is very complex, complicated. I still don't understand it within myself. I still have only begun to even try to lift the veil. Um, and I just hope that as I do, I can handle whatever I see. Um, you know, PTSD for me has also meant, you know, I've, I've been in a very long uh, serodiscordant relationship. And I love the term serodiscordant. The new term for 2024 is serodifferent. Um, but serodiscordant sounds dramatic. Sounds like rough, tough edges. It sounds ugly because it is. It's difficult to be in a zero discordant relationship for almost thirty years. Um, that has given me um, opportunities to not necessarily seek out other people with HIV for support. Another silly move. Um, people who are in zero discordant relationships, you know, um, in my humble opinion, would do well to always make sure they have a cadre of friends who also have HIV. Um, I worked at an HIV place that deals with HIV. And that was a great social outlet for me until I realized, no, dude, that's your job. You also need it. other stuff. <laughs> um, so PTSD, I, I'm, I, I think I know about it, but I kind of don't. I just know that um, I'm still really messed up from having HIV, even though I'm pretty. And um, I'm just, I just got to keep trying. So that's all. Yeah. You talk about support and I mean, Anyone with PTSD, the first thing they do is hook them up with other people, yeah. you know, in the same situation to get that right. support. And yeah. I think we all do that. And that's what we're doing here today. Yeah. I'm pretty good with trauma. 
most of the time. But if we look around the room, what are the demographics that we see? My trauma comes because I associate with a younger demographic. And when you're 35 years old and you're HIV and you won't go and use meds, when you don't want to use a condom, when you don't want to do these things, then the trauma comes in. That's when uh, Big Mama comes out <laughs> in a white form. <laughs> and it becomes when I no, you didn't. Because we owe it. We owe it to the generation after us for the pain that we have lived and still live. Any of us up here that say we're not in pain, we're, we're, we're lying because we're still, we're still in pain from the, uh, the HIV diagnosis. No matter how we manage it, it's manageable pain. But we owe it to be able to somehow put a lasso around some of these guys that are out there and help them to understand you have got to start getting treated because you're passing this disease on and on and on and on and on and it's going to keep being replicated until we get it through people's heads. Right. That's my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you, beautifully said. Now, we hear it said that HIV ends with me, and that's, that's, that's really true. You know, Jack and Andy were both talking about, you know, the PTSD and how it affects their, their love lives. So I think let's go there and talk a little bit about sex and dating. And so, <laughs> the fun stuff, right? You say that, yeah. And how your diagnosis of living with HIV has affected that and how it's maybe evolved over time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, oh, yeah, I used to know what it was like to get, ready, <laughs> get my freak on. on a, I used to, I was married. So, um, yeah, um, we were just talking about, <laughs> we were just talking about this. Yeah, I don't really, um, I haven't really tackled dating with HIV uh, living since I've been living with HIV, um, right after I had learned my diet, learned about my diagnosis, it was a very, very dear friend of mine. And we, I, when I moved back home, he was pursuing me again. And then I found out what was going on. I'm like, oh my God, you're not going to want to be bothered with me. And, oh no, there's nothing, you know, because you, you, you can't even say the words. So you have someone who has no, who's in your life, has no idea what's going on and you can't even communicate with them. Um, but we got through it. Uh, am I with someone now? No. Um, and that's okay. For real. That's okay. Cause I gotta be able to know what the heck I'm dealing with before I can bring someone else into my madness. Um, you know, you know, and, um, because of my past, uh, incomplete marriages, we'll say it like that, instead of using <laughs> the failed word. Um, I, I am confident that when it is time for someone to be in my life that loves my blue Jesus just like I do, <laughs> he will be there. And until then, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine with loving myself, caring for myself. Um, you know, I love me. I love me before, before I learned that I was living with HIV. I just put my foot down even more so now because I know how stressful it is to process that information and how it can come out in your health. So because of that, I don't have time for stress. I don't have time for madness. I don't have time for any of that. So yeah, no, I'm not with anyone right now. That's good enough. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. You know, you were talking earlier about um, how you know, disclosure, a bit of a, a, a disclosure comes up with dating as well. You know, and one of my favorite things to say about that is, you know, it really separates the men from the boys. Right. When you close to somebody, how they react shows you who they are, and you find that out right away. We did it. Okay. <laughs> so, Miss Benita. Thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah, we were just talking about that. And um, in in the workplace, yeah, it was how I, some, some, the feedback I got was, you know, it's gonna be, yeah, it's okay. You know, it was positive a little bit, but in the, in dating, oh, I hate mm -hmm. talking about dating. Y'all, you guys know the dating pool out there is trash. It's <laughs> y'all know, y'all know this already. Um, so no, um, uh, I was divorced in 2007. That's when I found, well, 2006, and I found out my status in 2007. So I've been single ever since, and I've tried to date. And I just said, it's, it's, it's I can't, I, I couldn't. Um, because of being a black woman, HIV positive, my self esteem was on the, was on the curb. Mm -hmm. So I was, of course, attracting very um, abusive relationships, and. Uh, I knew it was because of my me with the status. I knew I was allowing that because of my self-worth. I didn't have any self-worth, no value. I didn't even love myself. I was mad at myself. I was walking in shame, the, the darkness. So um, just recently, within the last, uh, what, two, three years, I'm just like, forget it. Just, just forget it. I, I, I can't. And today, I am a different person. I know my worth. I could care what you think. You know, um, it's, I'm a different person today. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 56 years old today. I don't have time. I don't have time. I, I don't got that type of time. Let, let me go out here and help somebody who wants this help. Mm. And, I, and, and you know, this open for it. And that's, that's it. That's all I got time for. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, um, so I do want to say there was moments when I, I did disclose because, and and but then you called me back a week or two and said, okay, okay, no, don't spin the block on me. You know, I wasn't good enough the first time. Don't this no no. You know, it's don't do not come back and spin the block. Keep that same energy. Keep it because I'm gonna keep it with you. Mm -hmm. I've th this is really this the 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 love the relationship thing for me is just. I had to find myself, you know, yeah. and I just, I love myself more today. So quick follow-up question. Has you equals you changed anything for you in the dating arena? <laughs> I, you know what? I, I don't, not for me. Mm -hmm. I don't, for real. I, I don't, but I don't know if I've given it a fair chance, if mm -hmm. that makes any sense. I don't think I've really given it a, a fair chance. Because I just cut it off. I just. Yeah. Well, it only works if the other people, or other person realizes that. Exactly. And do you want exactly. to have to educate them first? That, uh, yeah. well, thank you for that. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Okay, sure. Um, so I, I'm happy you mentioned you equals you, Jeff, because my mind was just burning. And <laughs> like a lot of my PTSD is due to mm -hmm. them taking so long to let us know about you equals you. Um, I, going back to not wanting to ever admit there's anything wrong with me, I really had to admit to myself that I felt um, like a piece of bio, biohazard who could kill someone. Um, and I, I, when I realized that after many years, it was, I almost, I, I, I almost, I was beside myself when I really, so that stigma or, you know, it was so unbeknownst to me. So um, yes, actually, of course it has affected my dating, my sex life. Um, now, like I said, I've been with the same guy since, you know, 98. Um, it has affected our sex life, but also we have a different, we're at another intersection because of our age difference. And so, um, you know, bringing other people into the relationship or even considering anything like that, um, the question of could I make someone sick? Do I want to talk to them about you equals you versus 
um, you know, what their options are. Um, it really has made me cut myself off from people. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we know about you equals you, you, we've known about you equals you for what, four or five years now. It hasn't set in. And I still don't get it, even though I know it intellectually down here. I, it's like, I'm barely even being able to perceive of even of, you know, doing anything with anyone. Um, so yeah, greatly affected, greatly, greatly affected. Um, and thank goodness I have this incredible person in my life who, who I'm, I've always been partnered with. Um, but that was a fluke of nature. I'm still pinching myself over that. Um, but yes, sex and dating, it's um, the greatest thing that happened was when I started meeting other people who have HIV. Yeah, yeah. And or like you said, um, separating the men from the boys. <laughs> Some fellows out there get it about you equals you and it's just not a thing anymore mm -hmm. but there's like the real hip characters and they're like they're not as prevalent we need more people who get it we need more people mm -hmm. in this world who understand about you equals you so you ladies can find the partners that you deserve because you're meant to be with people you're just you're fabulous so um yeah but it hurts it hurts it still hurts yeah i mean you equals you is kind of like crap right it took so long for that message to get out there and it really went to the gay community first, and we did not do a good job of making sure everybody knew about it. So there's a lot of communities where it's, it's But don't you blame the government, though? The government is oh, the yeah. one who sat on it. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't I don't get paranoid about that kind of stuff, but our government really screwed us. Yeah. It simply did. Not the first time, right? 40 years ago, I got with COVID, again with monkeypox. It's what's happened. Did you actually, actually use the word disclose? <laughs> hey, when it comes to this person sitting here, there's a lot to disclose. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's a whole new show. <laughs> and how do you disclose? When do you disclose? About what do yes. you discuss? <laughs> yes. So dating life. Let's see, dating that is a word in the dictionary, isn't it? <laughs> we'll just leave it right there right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to share this. This kind of, and I thought about this when we were asking, when I was asked about stigma that I've experienced. So this was my first of two, what I would call. Um, so I did a podcast and for my birthday month this year, I used this podcast to tell the world that I was living with HIV. And so I sent this podcast to just a friend from my Spanish class, just a friend. Like, yeah, that's it in my mind. So his response was, wow, simply wow. I didn't know your struggle. I heard a whole podcast and my deepest sympathies go out to you. Man, you could never tell with this disease who has it or who doesn't have it. And I'm glad you sent me this podcast. Now I know we will never ever be intimate, never ever be intimate but we can still be friends and you get my deepest, deepest condolences yet again. My response, <laughs> my response. Thank you for your acknowledgement. Not sure of the reason for the condolences. No death has taken place that I'm aware of. Intimacy comes in many different forms. So I find that part of your comment was pretty interesting, let alone that there'd even be a thought of any possibility in a physical way. <laughs> However, if learning about my U equals U status is what helped you make an uninformed decision to become intimate in ways beyond physical connection, then it was never meant to happen anyway. Trust that I am cool with your view of still being my friend, which is a form of intimacy as well. Then praise God for a way of escape. Because what I've learned from others is that when the right person is interested in becoming intimate with my mind, soul, and body, the status of my health will never be a deterrent.
And I didn't hear from him. And I was like, okay, come to find out a few days later, he ended up in the hospital. So this is what happens. <laughs> this is what happens when you, you know, mess with the wrong folks. Okay, I'm done. Talking about separating the men from the boys. You did it. Good for you. <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. What an amazing way to end this. Thank you all. Is there anything else? You know, we brought a lot of things up. Anything else anybody wanted to say before we end? Uh, if not, I just want to say I said this yesterday at the collaboration uh, in hmm. care conference in San Diego. And I just want to thank each and every individual here on this stage and in this room that has paved the way for us babies, us newcomers into this world so that we can become educated and confident to take the baton and help continue moving it forward. Wow. I just wanna say thank you for having me. Thank you for being here for me. Thank you, thank you for being here for me. Thank you for sharing your birthday with us. It's yeah. been a privilege. Happy birthday, Benita. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for having me today. Um, it's gotten a lot better having HIV. I'm happy for you both that you're experiencing it at this time. Um, even though I don't want to candy coat it, it is a pain in the ass, but <laughs> I'm just really happy that you do seem a little bit lighter than, mm -hmm. than I've been other folks. And God is good. We're yeah, good. We're lucky to be here in 2024. And I just think it's, we need to acknowledge how far we've come. Um, everybody thanks for listening to me. I don't feel particularly interesting, but I have been living with HIV for a very long time. So thanks for letting me share. Okay, thank you. I feel blessed to be here, blessed to be among y'all. And sometimes being HIV could be a gift in a strange way. If we begin to look at it that way. Again, thank you all. This is pretty amazing. Great. Take that selfie. Take a look at you at the road. And uh, thank you again. So next up, uh, a round of applause for our panelists. So it is my distinct privilege and joy to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for the day, uh, Ms. Wahida Shabazz L. Um, I've known Wahida for many years. She's been an amazing force in the Philadelphia community. She has an amazing story that you're about to hear. Um, I worked with her at the Reunion Project. I'm sure she'll talk a little bit about that. That supports people with HIV. And this conference started out as one of the first screening projects that was done in this country. It started in Chicago, and a few months later in the spring, we had a national conference right here in Palm Springs for everybody who wanted to be involved. And that's how the whole thing started. And that was the first of the nine, um, what, nine uh, positively AD projects that we've done here in Palm Springs. So, so I know, uh, Brad, can you say a few words? Do you have anything else you need to add before we start? Uh, like, no, I think I've got one. Okay. Covered it all. Okay. okay. <laughs> I still grant it, but that's all. We all know. <laughs> and now the time it goes to Ms. Wayne Shabazz. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Forward to it. Perfect. Perfect. Good afternoon. Who's going to pull this up for me? Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm short. I started to use my. <laughs> My last time, I didn't miss my mind because I wanted to be able to engage with you all. And I uh, started to use my laptop, but I'm short and I don't want to tell you to see my face. So I got a bunch of papers up here. So I'm going to just start by saying good afternoon. And first, I want to acknowledge the blessings from the Most High Creator for being here today with you in beautiful, beautiful um, Palm Springs um, at this Positively Aging Project. Um, Hello, sir. <laughs> and power. Yeah. Empowering journeys of people oh, living well, with HIV. Us. I want to thank the the, uh, the committee um, for helping for this yes. invitation, and also so that I can get a chance to share this space um, with you all and tell you a, a little bit about my journey. I'm here today, existing, living and thriving in defiance of those individuals and systems who had the audacity 
to deny me a human experience simply because I contracted a human virus. My name is Wahida Shabazz L. Lowry. My husband is here with me today. I am coming up on 72 years of age. I'm a wife, a mother, a sister, a grandmother, a great grandmother, a great aunt. I love music. I love shopping. I love traveling. I love laughing. I like to play Scrabble. I watch Star Trek every night. I make the best potato salad and the best baked macaroni and cheese that you've ever had. And I've been living with an AIDS diagnosis for 30 years. And actually, I had an AIDS diagnosis 22 years ago, but I already had to have it for 10 years before it was AIDS. But anyway, I do this long introduction for one reason. Because I don't like to leave with HIV. I'm so much more than my, than, than, than my diagnosis. So I don't like to leave with HIV because once we say HIV, Nobody no, hears anything else that you say, right? So, so when, when I, I get to mentor, mentor people who are wanting to be clear navigators and who are wanting to be outspoken um, with living with HIV, HIV, I always teach them, tell them who you are first. Don't leave with, the, well, don't leave with your condition because we're so much more than that. So before I get to sharing uh, part of my journey, I want to tell you currently I am the Director of Community Engagement for the Reunion Project. And the Reunion Project is the alliance for long-term survivors of HIV. We have an inclusive definition of long-term survivor, and that is it could be that you were diagnosed before, uh, before highly effective um, antiretroviral treatment. You could have HIV for 10 years. You could have gotten HIV when you were a young person, and maybe now you're an older person. Or you could have contracted HIV at birth or soon after birth, the, the uh, dandelions or the lifetime survivors that they call themselves, or you could be a person who lived alongside of us. You could be an ally to a person because our families, they also uh, are survivors. Our families and our loved ones are also survivors. So that is the Reunion Project, and I want to just make sure that you understood um, reunionproject.net <laughs> in the event that anybody wants to look us up and join our alliance. Um, So I want to talk about, and I have I have notes up here, but I'm going to be talking to you, right? So there is this challenge to address quality of life issues as we live longer than expected with HIV in a world with, that's just not prepared for us, just not prepared for us. And so we are more than our blood work. Our blood work does not indicate our quality of life, especially if you're living in a, in a, a a situation where you're facing domestic violence, or even if you're not living in your own home, maybe you're living in somebody else's home. Those are quality of life issues. So I want us to understand that we have to continue to demand that people living with HIV have seats at the decision-making tables and that we are consulted about programs and policies that's gonna impact our lives. Listen, we just can't afford to stop advocating for inclusiveness of people aging with HIV. We just can't afford to coast. You can't afford it. The last time I heard the only way you can coast is what? Downhill. We can't coast. We have to continue. I know we're tired. I know we've been doing this for years. We have to continue to demand that they acknowledge that we are still here and that we have life experiences that can help shape their programs and make their programs successful programs because nothing about us is for us without us, right? So I was offered, again, I told you, I was offered the opportunity to make some slides, but I thought it'd be better if I just talked directly to you. So let me take you back to 2003 when I was suffered from a drug addiction, which ended up in a six month incarceration for me. I, um, I almost have 22 years so in sobriety now that I love to, um, I'm just loving my sobriety. But back then, I did have a drug addiction as a direct result. I was incarcerated for six months in a county jail. Now I was already suffering from the humiliation um, of being incarcerated at the age of 50. And then the AIDS diagnosis was added to that. So when I took the test, I only took the test to get off the block, to walk around the jail, because I don't know if anybody here has been in jail besides me, 
but they pretty much keep you in one area. So I took the test. Um, and back then it took you two weeks to get the results. It wasn't a rapid test. So actually, when they came back to give me the results, I almost forgot not even taking the test. But I went back to the room with the tester to get my results. And she kept she said she said to me, Miss Shabazz, your test came back positive. Then she kept saying, I'm so sorry, Miss Shabazz. I'm so sorry. It's AIDS. Now I'm gonna tell you, while I was writing these remarks uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was thinking to myself, how did she know that from a swab? How did, because I know, now I know some stuff. Right? I'm like, how did she know that I had AIDS? And all she did was swab my mouth. However, she told me I already had AIDS. Um, and then she kept asking, she kept saying that she was so sorry, but she kept asking me, was there anybody I wanted to call? And like, who am I supposed to call? I'm 50 years old, I'm in jail, I have AIDS, I messed up my life, I'm going to lose, you know, uh, my, 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 uh, my, my job. I, had a, I was working for, for the government. I had a government job, I was about to lose, everything was going down the drain. Um, and I remember that the correctional officer, I was crying, and, the, and so we're in a jail, so you can't have a room without any doors or windows. So there's a window, people are walking by, and they're looking, they know this is the room. They know this is the room where I'm getting this test, and they're seeing me crying, so they know. The correctional officer sort of know what's going on. Um, so I told her I didn't have anybody to call. I didn't know what I would say if I called anybody, so she gave me a pamphlet about HIV, and she sent me back to my cell. Now, I'm 72. I converted to Islam when I was 19 years old. Um, my husband and I have been married for 18 years, and he's not Muslim. He's Christian. But I grew up as a fire-burning, fire-breathing Pentecostal, right? So, um, yeah, so I had a Bible. I'm in jail, right? I had a Bible, and I had a Quran that I had found in the library in the jail. And I would slip this little pamphlet inside the Quran because nobody asked to borrow my Quran. They would say, well, he did, could I borrow your Bible? But nobody asked to borrow the Quran. That was my own, that was my little safe place. And I would read it and I would read the Quran, but I was reading that pamphlet over and over and over again. And then I would drift off to sleep and I figured, I said, well, I'll die tonight while I'm sleeping because I thought that's how it happened. I thought you just drift off and you just die. Um, in fact, my mother died before I died. Um, about a month after I got my diagnosis, my mother died, and um, I was too ashamed to even go to her grave in an orange jumpsuit. Orange is not the new blue, or whatever they call it. I was ashamed to go on a, in an orange jumpsuit and hand and foot shackles, and I felt that I had this HIV was just burnt into my forehead. I just felt that everybody would know everything, and I just refused to go, and I thought I was going to die anyway, so I was just waiting, and I, I would die one night when I went to sleep. That's what I figured but I kept waking up alive. Maybe it was those ARVs they were giving me in jail, right? So I was getting, I was bouncing back. They were giving me ARVs. I kept waking up alive. Now I'm going to tell you about, I told you I'm talking about the audacity, right? So I'm going to tell you, I'm about to tell you about the first audacity that I, that I saw. So when I got diagnosed, I wasn't what they call um, low confinement. I wasn't a big threat. So I was in this building. It was something like this. It was, it was bright lights. It was air conditioned, right? But then after I got diagnosed, I got transferred to another jail in Philadelphia that was called the Cannery. This cannery sat next to Holmesburg Prison. You may have ho ho heard of Holmesburg Prison. The Cannery was a little building that sat next door that used to be the horse stable for the correctional officer used to take you to jail in a horse in a horse and buggy or something, I guess. But this cannery, it didn't have cells, it had stalls. So they had little bunk beds in the stalls. The stall only came up this far, like a horse would lean over it. And so if you were in the top bunk, you were just up in the air, right? Because it wasn't, it, they didn't, it didn't have doors. So there I was in this horse stable, and I said, I guess this is where you go when you have AIDS. Right. So that was the first audacity because I because it wasn't a human experience for me. Right. Um, it was very dehumanizing. So um, I received an official visitor and I thought it was an attorney. I thought it was an attorney. It was a man. His name was John Bell. And I thought he was an attorney. 
But when he came and they told me I had an official visit, he started talking about having HIV and AIDS. He started talking about AIDS. I'm like, who is this guy? And he started telling me that he had been living with AIDS for over 20 years, and he told me I wasn't going to die. He was the bridge that I needed to get out the troubled water. That's what I realized today, right? Because I was in the murky water. I was in the horse stable. I was, you know, I was, you know, 50 years old. I was going to lose my good guy. I had been on the job for 19 years at that point. And everything was up. You know, everything was, was up. And so um, what really got to me, what gave me hope was he said to me, he said, I went to the other place looking for you the place with the bright lights and the air conditioning. He said, and they told me you had been transferred. He said, so I came to find you. That means so much to me, even right now, like 22 years, 22 years later, he said he came to find me. I was at my lowest point. I didn't think anybody would take a call from me or especially like come to find me. I figured he just put me at the bottom of the list. And when, he came, when I, my name came back around, he would come and see me, but he said he came to find me and he gave me so much hope. Um, yeah, and he told me that he was there to help me. Linkage, he was the linkage specialist. <laughs> he was there to make sure that when I got out, I would get linked to care and I would continue my care. That's what he was there for, but he was also a member of ACT UP Philadelphia. And that part, so I was like, really, it was really like a bridge for me, meeting this person who was an AIDS activist who not only was going to teach me how to live with HIV, he was going to teach me how to fight, right? Um, and so when I got out, I told some women of my, like I talk about my faith now, right? Because I, I, um, I told a few women who are Muslim um, that I was living with HIV because I needed that support from that loving community that I had been in already for 30 years. And they told me that they wasn't sure if I should even come into the mosque. They told me that I would probably contaminate the rug. So I don't know if you've ever seen a mosque or not, but when we go into a mosque, we, we prostrate. So we, we take off our shoes to keep the rug clean, and we prostrate our foreheads on the ground, on the floor when we're, when we're praying. And they told me that they didn't think that I was suitable, that I might contaminate the rug. So again, um, I was devastated. Now, I don't know what people here believe, but I believe that God works through people. So let me tell you the people that God worked through for this Muslim, and it was the LGBT community. And I say this every chance I get, because it had it not been for the wealth, for the LGBT community welcoming me in, no judgment, no questions, with just love, whether you need to navigate your life, the needs assessment, nobody at, this is not a condom, right? <laughs> this, this does not prevent HIV. Right, but no one said anything. They just wanted to know, like, what do you need? We're gonna help you, we're gonna guide you, you know, we're gonna help you out. Um, and watching that community, watching the LGBT community in Philadelphia endure insufferable stigma, watching them go through discrimination, another audacity, right? Because these from, from, from they were going through stigma and discrimination from individuals and systems that wanted to deny them to have a human experience, to, not, to deny them love, to deny them community, right? And I watched them live, and I watched them breathe, and I watched them experience um, creating their own families. They would call them houses. Uh, they, they adopted me into the house of Lamore. These were women of trans experience who adopted me into their houses. So I had an instant extended family because I hadn't told my own family, right? When a lady asked me on the phone, who was I going to call? Who was I? I didn't have anybody to call to tell them that. Um, so after, so, so I learned to live, I learned to live my own truth as a Muslim living with HIV. I learned to live out loud. A lot of Muslims didn't appreciate that this Muslim woman was walking around talking about she had HIV because I'm supposed to only tell that to God. I'm supposed to take that in prayer. So two years after my diagnosis, um, I, I got, listen, when I disclose, the first time I disclose, I should say share my status. I had a boyfriend before I left the room. It was very sexy. I need to say that. 
I'm serious. And it wasn't my husband. Sorry about that. But listen, when I came up, when because when I finally decided to, you know, to share my status, before I left, somebody told me that was some sexy stuff you did up there. I'm like, okay. So, you know, it all depends. But um, but so two years after my diagnosis, I got married to my second husband, who's now deceased. Um, and at that time, I asked my friend Jackie Adams, who's also now deceased, a woman of trans experience, to be my maid of honor at my wedding. So here I was, a Muslim woman, marrying a man who was a black Israelite. He wasn't, a, he wasn't an Israelite to be on the corners, but he was a black Jew. <laughs> Muslim woman marrying a black Jew with a trans, a uh, black trans woman was my maid of honor. That was the, that was, yeah, that was the thing. That was my community. That was my community. And my advocacy took off right away because as soon as I was released, my friend John Bell, he gave me numbers to call. He gave me about three or four numbers to call. Right. And I tried to disqualify myself. I tried to call the number. I thought he wouldn't ask. I thought he wouldn't answer. But he did. And he asked me to meet him down at the clinic. He got me involved in the clinic. He got me enrolled in a class, an adult literacy class for HIV that happens in Philadelphia called Project Teach. And he also got me involved in something called the Philadelphia County Coalition for Prison Health Care. I'm like, whoa, yeah, I, I need to do that because I got diagnosed in jail and I saw that the health care in jail was sub suboptimal, right? That's where I met my husband at, the one I have now. <laughs> we were both a part of the Philadelphia County Coalition on Prison Health Care, right? But uh, then John Bell started taking me to ACT UP meetings, and I was becoming this fierce advocate before I knew it. And I, I had worked through all my internalized stigma, or so I thought, or so I thought. So when I realized, let me tell you what happened when I thought. I was good when I thought I had worked through all of my internalized stigma, right? So I have a girlfriend who I was at her house and she had she had a grandbaby with her. This is the girl, this is the only person that I had told I was living with HIV. She was my bestie, right? And I was at her house and she had the grandbaby and the grandbaby kept crying. She said, Wahida, would you please pick up the baby? I said, sure, I'll pick up the baby. I picked the baby up, I rocked the baby. Then in my head, I said, oh, girl, don't hold that baby too long. You don't want her to think that you're going to give her baby aid. And I'm like, now, I had been to these classes. I had been doing speeches. I knew I couldn't give this baby aid, but it came in my head, so I put the baby down. The baby started crying again. She said, Wahida, can you pick up the baby? I said, okay. I picked the baby up. I rocked the baby. Here I go again. Don't hold her baby too long. Because you know she might think you're going to give her baby AIDS. I laid the baby down again. The third time she said to me, bitch, pick up the baby. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. So I realized it was me. And I realized I had more work to do on my internalized stigma. I talk about the audacity of people and systems who wanted to deprive me of having the human experience. And here I was doing the same exact thing, right? So I went, I started doing more, more trainings from on myself. I started doing advocacy trainings that led me to what I what we call the root cause analysis. And I'm going to share that with you in just a minute. Um, JD Davids. Um, is a trans a trans man um, who is one of the smartest people I know. He's absolutely brilliant. Um, I knew JD then when JD was not a trans man. JD was her pronouns was she and her. Now she had me know why he it's JD. It's JD. I said okay, I got to get used to that. But JD was the executive director of an organization called Champ Community Organization Community. Some 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 HIV. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyway, anywho, um, JD, we were talking about, we started talking about the intersections of racism and the HIV didn't just happen by itself. The HIV happened, there were all these other factors that HIV happened with, right? And so the root cause analysis states that HIV is a symptom of larger problems, right? That HIV is the positive proof of denial or disregard 
for human rights because you could only have a pandemic like we have here when people's human rights have been disregarded. HIV is a social disease. It's just as much, it's, it's more of a social disease than it is a medical disease, right? And so this is the H, this is the root cause analysis of HIV. Armed with this type of information, here comes the third audacity. I have found that using the social justice framework helps me to reduce the external, because the, the audacity was the external um, uh, um, um, stigma, thank you. The audacity was the external stigma that was coming from individuals and systems who wanted to dehumanize me, right? But it, they never told me that HIV, they, I, they had me thinking that I had caused HIV, I had, I had the total blame of con getting contracting HIV. They never said anything about any social, we call them social, social deterrents, because I know we have people here who are social workers, right? I like to call them vulnerabilities, right? Vulnerabilities that predispose me to contract HIV in the first place, in the first place, right? So these vulnerabilities are systems or there may be factors that we don't have a lot of control over. So when we talk about racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, poverty, lack of health care, homelessness, exclusion of women, war on drugs, mass incarceration, undiagnosed mental health, language barriers, unemployment, truancy, absence only education, these are all factors that we cannot separate from HIV. HIV doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen because somebody did this. This is sex. Because somebody did this. This is not going to cause an entire pandemic around the world. What causes the pandemic is that when we have decision makers and governments who don't have the, who, who have lost the willingness to, um, to stand up to what they say, they go to the United Nations every year and they stand in the United Nations every year and they make these promises. They're going to feed everybody. They're going to give everybody health care. Everything's going to be all right. And then they go back home and they do nothing. And that's how, we have a, that's how we have a pandemic around the world, which is another audacity. And I feel that stigma remains a huge challenge, especially for those of us who have not found the inner acceptance or safety or support to live out loud. If you haven't found a community to help you live out loud, Stigma remains a huge challenge for us. I heard the women say, some of the speakers up here say earlier, it's because of this room, it's because of these people, it's because of this community that they have the courage, right, to stand up and say that they're living with HIV. Here's another audacity. I used to always hear, and I, I don't allow people to come into a room with me now and just say, HIV is preventable. I heard a Providers say one time, HIV is 100% preventable. And I'm looking like, well, how the hell, is, why is all we here? If HIV is preventable, I mean, I'm not the smartest. Listen, I ain't the sharpest tag in the box. Right, but that part, right? So, HIV is preventable in an ideal world. HIV is only preventable in an ideal world. HIV is not preventable when people are homeless. HIV is not preventable when people don't have health care. HIV is not preventable when people can't read. These are social factors I've talked about that you can't separate from HIV, right? So buying into HIV is, is preventable statements cause people living with HIV to take the total blame. That's how we end up in the fetal position, blaming ourselves because we've allowed somebody to come into a room with us and say to us HIV is preventable. It's only preventable in the ideal world, y'all. It's only preventable where people's human rights are upheld. It's only preventable where people, people have a quality of life that's higher than that of an animal. That's when HIV becomes preventable. And until our governments, until our decision makers make those social changes in our, in our, in our, in our, in our lives, in this world, we're going to continue to see HIV. So that's the root cause analysis. The HIV doesn't happen in the vacuum. That is more than a virus. It's the proof that people's human rights have been disregarded.
And I'm going to talk just a little bit about guilt and shame because I heard a lot of that today too. These kind of statements, guilt and shame, creates It creates shame on people living with HIV that we think that we contracted HIV and we carry around guilt and shame in our lives. Guilt and shame are two different things. They're not the same. We say them, all, we say them together all the time, but they're not the same. Guilt says something happened, an act happened. And guilt is something you can do over. Guilt, like something like, I, I didn't call my mother. I feel a little pain. I feel a little stress. I feel a little, a little discomfort, right? I feel a little pang of guilt. I didn't call my mother. I didn't change the kitty litter, right? But I could, these are things I can do over again because I could call my mom. I could change the kitty litter, right? I didn't give the baby the medicine at 2 o'clock. I could give the baby the medicine at 4 o'clock when I remember, right? So guilt and shame, but I just, guilt is the act. Shame says something wrong with me, says something wrong with you. And we kind of, when we stop carrying this shame, and let me tell you about shame. Shame is lethal. Shame, shame will kill you. Shame will have you in a ball by yourself in a room. Shame will have you have secrecy. It will keep you in silence. And in this disease, silence will equal death. It will cause you not to process. Shame will cause you not to process your pain. And that's an emotional and spiritual violence to ourselves because we have to process this pain. And here's the hit. Here's the hit. Add empathy. What we're doing here. Add empathy. And empathy kills shame. Shame can't survive empathy. Shame can't survive what we're doing right here in this room today. Right? The empathy is what we bring for knowing what it is to live with HIV. That's the empathy of us having spaces to tell our stories. It eliminates shame. Empathy eliminates shame. Shame can survive when we put empathy in place, when we have programs and, and create safe spaces where we can share our stories. I'm gonna begin to wrap it up, but I'm still gonna need about five minutes, All right? Allowing people to continue to state HIV is preventable without addressing the vulnerabilities, without addressing those, deter those social deterrents, right? It creates the smoke screen of stigma. It creates a smoke screen of stigma. When we allow people to say HIV is preventable and that's it, and there's a period behind that, it creates a smoke screen of stigma. And you know, you could die from smoke inhalation, right? <laughs> We know that, right? Okay, so here's the thing. What do we have to gain? What do we have to gain by applying a root cause analysis lens to this HIV epidemic? She keeps talking, I keep talking about the root cause analysis. What do we have to gain by knowing that someone was homeless, someone was hungry, someone couldn't read, someone didn't go to school, their language wasn't the right language, they didn't have health care, they had untreated, un undiagnosed mental health. What do we have to gain by having this, having this information? What we have to gain is the entitlement of our birthright. That's what we have to gain. Shame is not our birthright. That's what we have to gain. We have the right to live, to love. In fact, live, love. Love is a human right. We need love just, just like we need water. We can't live without it. Things that are alive need to be touched, need to be felt, need to be loved. That's why we talk to our plants, right? Because, yeah, because they, they, we think they hear us and they know, they know that we're touching them, and they do. We were not created. To, to live in shame. In the words of an American writer and anthropologist, her name is Zora Neale Hurston. She says, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So I wanna end my talk as I began by thanking the spiritual authority for this gathering, that as people living with HIV, we have found a community in one another. And when they have the audacity 
to tell you that you are not good enough, you tell them not only am I good enough, I'm more than enough. I've learned to walk heavy. I don't walk light. When I walk into a room, pull out your respirators because I'm sucking up all the air in the room. There's nowhere, there's nowhere that we don't belong. There are no doors that we cannot open. In fact, these doors open for us today. So things are changing a little bit. Through this community, I've found the strength to challenge the audacities of the individuals and systems that deny us a human experience. And I have found the courage to intentionally claim my space to live and to breathe and to love because they're human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juanita. That was amazing. You know, I've known you all these years. I, mean, I learned something new. My new catchphrase is going to be, bitch, pick up that baby. <laughs> so, um, We've got some time for Q and A, um, so I know you know a lot of you have been here all day long and, and you know listened to a lot. So if you have any questions or comments or anything you'd like to make or questions, especially for our speaker now, um, here's your chance. Go ahead, raise your hand, and somebody will bring you a, a microphone. So uh, while we're waiting, um, Wahid, if you want to talk a little bit more about uh, what you do with the reunion project, how you got started with them, and kind of the work your work you're doing. Thank you. Near, near about the bus, right? Thank you. Yeah. So um, the reunion project came through Philadelphia in 2015, I believe it was. And it was Jeff Taylor. It was Jeff Berry. It was Matt Sharp. And it was Greg. Thank you, Greg Cassins. Four white gay men came through Philadelphia. But in, in Philadelphia, and they came, and Chris Bartlett, who lives in Philadelphia, who's the executive director of our William Way LGBT Center, hosted the event. But they asked, they said they wanted to, they wanted to have more diversity in the reunion project. They needed to have people of color, they needed to have women. And Jeff Taylor stepped aside so that we could bring in, because we only, I remember Jeff Taylor stepped aside so we could make sure that diversity happened. I'm a part of that diversity. I've been with the reunion project since 2015. I remember the first event that we had and I was on board. I remember Matt Sharp said, oh my God, they have women here. I said, yeah, I said, well, you guys, well, you guys uh, wanted, wanted to have women here, right? So um, what we've done, what I do is I have a program work group that consists of a very diverse, we have trans masculine men, we have trans women of trans experience, we have Latinx people. We have all sorts of people, um, ethnicities and races and gender, and um, on our on our what we call our program work group. And what we do is we keep the reunion project going. We determine what are going to be our webinars. We do we do two virtual national webinars a year, which runs three hours. We also go around about three or four times a year. We go to different parts of the country where we hold two-day community gathering events, right? So to fight the audacity, we bring people together so we can share our stories because there's power in us sharing our stories and power in our resilience for people who are newer, who need that power, right? And so we do that. And then, um, yeah, so, so and then we also have what we call a toolkit, a work, a toolkit, a we have a toolkit work series that we also do. So every other month we have um, a webinar on a specific topic. Um, we've had topics from heterosexual men living with HIV to trans men living with HIV to dandelions or, or what we call life, but they call themselves lifetime survivors living with HIV. We've had one, we have one webinar about everybody's anus for good, for good anal health. So, you know, we just we just run the gambit of what long-term survivors um, may need to know these conversations that we have. So because we live in a virtual world, a lot of our stuff is virtual, but we do go around three or four times a year. We just left. Um, we know, but that wasn't, that, that was, that was, you know, we just left, we just left Denver. We just did a, we, this year we did Chicago, 
We did Baltimore in person. We did two days in Chicago, two days in Baltimore, two days in Denver, Colorado, and the next month we're doing two days in Jackson, Mississippi. That's in person. But then you also have the opportunity to be a part of our alliance of long-term survivors so that you know when we're having our um, uh, two virtual town halls, we don't call them town halls anymore, two virtual reunion meetings, one in June around, long, around um, Long-Term Survivor Day, and then one in December right after World AIDS Day. So we're working on one now. Um, did I miss anything? That's it. You're, on, you're in yeah. charge of all that. Yeah. So yeah. So if anybody have any questions they'd like to ask or comments about the root cause analysis, or why we should be standing up. Or did anybody thought that they caused this HIV epidemic or that's because you had sex? Is anybody here carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders because they're living with HIV? Because you can put, put, put the hammer away and, and tickle yourself with a feather, right? Because you got all these things that you're fighting against. You're fighting against all of these different social deterrents, right? And it comes to the, I get to ask people, well, how come you didn't get it? <laughs> by us all living in the same world. You know what I'm saying? But for those of us who have found the courage to stand up and live out loud, it's going to help the next wave and the next wave and the next wave because it's not going to stop. And I want to say one more thing about to your hand. One more thing about you equals you. We have to make you equals you a part of HIV care. Our doctors are not talking about you equals you in this country. You it was you in other countries. It's 140 countries that have adopted you because you. They dancing. They got banners. They got. They doing raps. They doing it all. And you know what we do in the United States of America? Nothing. Our providers don't talk to you. Don't even talk to us about you because you. When we go into the providers' office, we have to make our providers talk about you because you. We have to call them out and invite them to the podium. Talk about you equals you to these people today. That's my next plan. That's when we'll do that in, um, in February. I'm inviting the provider to 200 people to talk about you equals you because they need to be saying it. They need to give the education to the communities so that these two young ladies right here don't have to be, y'all don't need to be alone at farmersonly.com. <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, so do you want to ask a question? I do have a question. So uh, you found your purpose because you are a very inspiring, and I thank you for your words today. Um, my question is uh, related to a conversation that we've had for a while. I, I partner with with Harp for a while, and <clears throat> one of the dialogue that one of the dialogues that we've had is about the cure. And one of the questions that I would like to ask you is, if it was offered to you tomorrow, would you take it? If it's not as if the cure, it can't be worse than a disease. First of all, let me say that it can't be it can't be harder than the disease. Um, but I'm 72, and to be honest with you, um, I'm riding this out personally. Now, if I was like 20, if I was a early a, a person who was younger, I would absolutely right. But for me, I gotta take a pill for something anyway. My ankles are swollen up. I gotta go to the bathroom all the time. You know what I'm saying? I gotta take a pill for something anyway. I think somebody said he got high cholesterol. So I'm going to take this pill. I'm going to take this pill. And when this pill don't stop working, we're going to go back. We're going to talk about something else. I am, I am not against, I'm not against injectables. I'm not against even cure research. I advocate for cure research, right? Because somebody has to be, you know, be the persons in the study. So we'll know that it's going to be, it's going to work for us, right? But um, right now where I stand in this moment and this time, I'm good. I'm good. Nope. Yeah. So, here. Uh, um, so this is my question. Um, as a fellow Philadelphia native, I want to know, um, have you seen, since you've been doing this work, any reduction in stigma, particularly in uh, Philadelphia's African-American community? I'm going to say no, to be honest with you. I'm going to say no. Stigma is alive and well. We got people who still don't know how HIV is transmitted, right? We still have people who are referring to us as infected. We still have people saying that those people are promiscuous. This is stigmatizing, the stigmatizing language. We as people living with HIV, have a, we have a responsibility now to teach people 
how to refer to us. We are people with AIDS. That's the Denver principles. We are not promiscuous. We just like more than one partner. You see what I'm saying? So there's all there are there are non-stigmatizing ways that need that that we need to train our community members like how to talk to us because I see what I I'm gonna tell you what I do see in Philadelphia. I see a very strong HIV community in Philadelphia. And it doesn't matter what our sexuality is. We all ride together. Straight, gay, curved. We all, you know, age. Listen, the AFABs. I just learned about the AFABs. Assigned female at birth. We hang out with them. We all hang out together in Philadelphia because we know that, we know that our strength is our diversity. So we've learned that, right? And so we prepare. We, whenever we have a committee to do anything, we make sure that that committee is a diverse of some population of everybody, Latinx people, people who don't speak English, you know, and we just kind of do that. But I don't see that um, stigma has um, has really um, stopped at all in Philadelphia. It just may be like a little quieter, like racism is not as bold as it used to be, you know what I'm saying? But it's still there. Hi. So um, thank you, yes. uh, actually, to everybody that's uh, spoken today. And we've talked a lot about stigma. We've talked about shame. Mm -hmm. And amongst the HIV community, I think we're doing a great job. But how do we spread that to a younger generation that is not aware of HIV, that does point the finger, that does have the negative view? How, how, do, we, how do we change them or how do we educate them? Because I don't see that being done. Well, first of all, we have to allow them to educate us. When it comes to young folks, you have to give them the space to educate you. Even though you want to give them some jewels, you got to bring them into a space and tell them that we want to pick your brains about certain things. And then we have to drop some jewels on them while we're there. Right. Um, young folks, you know, they think they know. You know how we are when we were young. You couldn't tell us nothing. But you, so we have to create spaces to bring young people in. And we have to ask them, not tell them what we want them to do. We have to ask them, what are they willing to do, right? If we give them information, are you willing to take this information to your peers, right? Um, and then we have to give them incentives to come into the room, right? We have, there's a lot of things that we have to do, but um, they, we, we're not going, they're not going to sit and let us tell them stuff, but we could create a space where we're having a dialogue and we bring it up. It's the same thing, the people who are trying to have HIV ministries. We want to all start HIV ministries in our places of worship. No, we don't need HIV ministries. We need ministries for people with HIV. And that's the difference because language matters. Words matter. Words have power. So when you say HIV, like I introduced myself, I told y'all a whole bunch of stuff before I finally said I had AIDS. Y'all knew I had AIDS when I walked in the room. But, <laughs> but if I'm in a place of people who don't know that, that's not going to be the first thing out of my mouth because I want you to hear me, right? Because when I get off the stage, all they want to know is what's in the potato salad. <laughs> That's all they want to know. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so we have to, like, be smart. We have to be a little smarter, a little crafty, create spaces for them. And, as, you know, and we do have some things that we need to get from them. And maybe we can ask them what they know about HIV. What do you know about it? Give them a focus group. What do you know about it? Then give them a little, a little curriculum, a little course. Then we teach them that we let them come back and then tell us again, what do they know about it? And then what are they willing to do with the information? Are you willing to share this information with your peers? Creating that community. Yes. Yeah, we, and they have to be a part. They have to feel that they're safe here in our community because they are living with HIV. They're living in the dark you know, with HIV, right? Their parents have put them out of the house because of their sexuality and things like that. So they're carrying a lot too. Yeah. Is there another question? Okay, well, can you raise your hand and say, I intentionally claim my space to live and to love with HIV. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wahido. Amen. That's all I got to say. I feel like I've been in black church for the last hour. <laughs> so with that, we'll turn it over to Brad to uh, close this out. Jeff, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone today for uh, being here.
our uh, hosting partners, Eisenhower Health and Viv uh, Healthcare and the Bizel Center for uh, hosting us again this year. Um, just please do fill out your survey and don't forget about the uh, little raffle ticket at the bottom. I can put up our little uh, one more time, our prize of a Fire HD 10 if you fill out the survey and we choose you. And again, thanks to everyone today. Um, and again, how about our volunteers? Uh, could all of our volunteers stand up or raise your hand? Many of them are not in the room, are not in the room or have uh, maybe have departed already because they were helping earlier. But we thank everyone again this year. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing you again next year. It will be number 10, number 10 next year. This is Brad Fur from KG and Gay Desert Guide saying thank you so much today and thanks for joining us.